Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and I am going to tell you a wonderful story that will lull you into a peaceful and restful sleep. Tonight, we'll hear about the myth of Pandora's Hope. Listen well, for in between the lines of this story, you may find many secrets of the human race, from fortunes to misfortunes, from weaknesses to strengths. And perhaps you will, as the ancient Greeks did, hold this story close in your heart and remember its meaning. But before we begin the story, let yourself relax and let go of any other thoughts and cares that may fill your mind at this moment. It's a good idea to be still and in an almost meditative state of mind when trying to fall asleep. The less you think about falling asleep, the easier sleep may come. So, take a deep breath and inhale. Rest, repose, relaxation. Then exhale and let go of any heavy thoughts or worries of the day. Let's do a couple more inhales and exhales and feel the weight of our bodies sinking deep into the mattress. If you are lying on your back, allow your hands to fall naturally by your sides, palms up, fingers relaxed and unclenched. Another deep inhale and again exhale. And when you are ready. I'll tell you the story. Pandora was the first woman the gods ever created. And, as is expected of gods creations, she was the most beautiful creature they had ever made. As they looked upon her on the pedestal in the great hall, they marveled at this work of art. They called her Pandora, meaning all-giving, but not even the gods themselves realized at that first moment that it would be the woman herself who would become the greatest gift to humanity. It was Zeus, the god of gods, who combined a bit of earth and a bit of water needed the consistency until it became clay in his hands and began to work on the female form. Carefully and with artistry only known to the gods, he formed her curves, her tresses, her body. With his swift hands, he made her fingers take shape. Her hips and legs sway. When he was finished creating this creature, he invited the other gods and goddesses to bestow upon her any gift they wished. And so, the goddesses came, one by one, astounded by Zeus's latest work of art. Never before had they seen such a creature. Athena gave her the gift of craft, the skill with which her hands and fingers would learn about everything in the world. The goddess Aphrodite decided that she would gift her with charm and grace and teach her how to use her beauty to work wonders on earth. But Aphrodite also gave her another gift, 
a painful yearning and consuming obsession. Everything she saw and knew, she would question further. She would become obsessed with knowing and knowing even more. Hermes, patron of both shepherds and thieves, thought this female creature was wonderful to behold. But what was a human without a knavish nature? He decided this would be his gift, and that her mind would never stop being busy. Zeus, creator of Pandora, thought Hermes' gift was clever. Teach her to be stubborn, Hermes, he suggested. Teach her to teach the males a lesson. With her charm and her wit, she'd be a match for the best of them. Her curiosity will get the better of her, said Hermes. But you have done well, mighty Zeus. This little creature is a wonder, even for me to behold. The other gods and goddesses, too, gave their attributes. And as Pandora was blessed by each of them, her skills added to her beauty. When all the gods and goddesses were finished, Zeus had one more gift for Pandora, a jar which he instructed her never to open. Pandora, of course, was now filled with even more curiosity. Only the gods and goddesses knew that the jar contained all the misfortunes in the world and that Pandora would be a keeper of these mysteries. Zeus reminded Pandora every year on her birthday, how wonderfully she had been gifted, and that she was indeed a gift to this earth. He loved to watch her beauty and curiosity grow, and every time Pandora would ask him about the jar, his answer would be the same. You ought to keep the jar secure and closed, never open it, for that would be a great misfortune. Pandora, Wanting to please Zeus in every way, much like a good daughter wishes to please her father, obeyed for many, many years. And as the years passed, her curiosity grew even more than before. Anyone who looked upon her, even the gods, were taken with wonder. She was a sight to behold her auburn hair flowing like waves upon the sea. Pandora often adorned her hair with flowers, leaves, and pretty things. She loved to be admired for her beauty, but at the same time, she wished that folks would also look at her and behold her other skills, her active mind, her depth of character, and strength of will. One day, when Pandora was of marrying age, she was sent by Hermes to Epimetheus, the twin brother of Prometheus. Now, Epimetheus and Prometheus were titans. They were strong and powerful and known among the land for their skills and physical abilities. Epimetheus represented nature and materialism and did not possess the foresight that Prometheus did. His brother, knowing his weaknesses, had warned Epimetheus that accepting any gift from other gods was unwise, especially a woman. And yet, Epimetheus had a tendency to listen to cravings of his physical body, without minding his thoughts and common sense first. In the past, he had heeded his brother's strong warnings, but not today. Today, he saw, standing before him, the loveliest creature on earth. When he gazed into her eyes, he felt as if he were swimming in the depths of the ocean, and at the same time, flying on the weightless clouds above. When she spoke, Hello. His senses seemed to escape him completely. 
He stood in awe that Zeus would give him such an incredible gift. Epimetheus forgot completely about his twin brother's warning and took Pandora as his wife. As she prepared for the wedding, Pandora's heart was filled with love for her soon-to-be husband. He entertained her and seemed to understand her mental state. While other males she had encountered before seemed bothered by her incessant questions, this one did not. In fact, on most days, Epimetheus welcomed the strange curiosity of his betrothed. It made her do things other women would not. Creative things. Beautiful things. Pandora was eager to learn, and it showed in the way she passed her days. She would never sit idle. Her mind was too busy for that. She asked Epimetheus to teach her about the harvest, the weather, the seasons, the changes in nature and in the earth. He told her all he knew, how the world was created by gods, and the same gods were responsible for many of the natural events she could see and feel with her own eyes. He also taught her how to understand animals in the way that he did, how to appreciate their presence and communicate with them. He taught her that all living creatures needed each other, both for companionship and for sustenance. And he also taught her the ways of love, what it felt like to be held and cherished by another being, the warmth of an embrace and the closeness of a beating heart that could be both felt and heard in the night. These were all the things the young couple enjoyed together in the days leading up to their wedding. And as those days passed, their intimacy grew. This heightened their dependency on one another. And although Pandora and Epimetheus were not alike in many ways, they learned by spending time together how much their differences balanced the other. Soon, It was time for the great wedding, and those who had heard of the lovely couple had come from all corners of the earth to pay their respects. On that fateful day, Pandora sat in her chambers, combing her hair and lathering her skin with sweet balms and essential oils. She thought many happy thoughts, as well as many curious thoughts. She hoped she would be a good wife to her husband. She thought of all the meals she would prepare for him and all the adventures they would go on together. Her lover had promised to take her sailing on the ocean and teach her new languages which he had been taught by people from other lands. She imagined what their children would be like, look like, and feel like, and As Pandora was thinking all these thoughts, her mind wandered to the jar. That mysterious jar. The one Zeus had instructed her so long ago never to open. Oh, but what could be the harm in it? She wondered aloud. Surely Zeus was only testing me, as he does so many times with other humans, and even with other gods. Surely he only wants my obedience and subservience, and haven't I remained faithful for so long? Obedient for so long? Oh, if I never know what is inside that jar, I feel as if I will perish from curiosity. In the end, Pandora could take it no longer. She heard the sounds of wedding music, the chants of those preparing to celebrate outside. She felt that if she never opened the jar, then, alas, she might regret not knowing. Slowly, she let her ivory comb slip to the floor and reached out her hands to cradle the mysterious haunting jar instead. 
Carefully and with utmost gentleness, she eased the jar's lid and twisted it until it gave way. Pandora heard the whispers, even before her eyes beheld the box's contents. They were whispers of strange things. Pandora froze as the spirits of pain, ghosts of dark and unfriendly things began to pour out of the jar, swirling around the room. They were the spirits of misery, depression, sadness, and agony. Pandora had never seen or felt such grief before. Immediately, she was sorry she had disobeyed Zeus. She wondered what calamities she had allowed out into the world. She tried to cover the jar with the lid, but it was too late. Evil had escaped, making its way out into the world. Her soon-to-be husband came rushing in. As he heard the commotion coming from her room, he found Pandora, tears streaming down her face. What have you done? He cried. But one look and he knew at once. The secret was out. Not only Pandora's secret, but many more. The secrets of darkness set loose into the world. I was curious. Too curious, cried Pandora, embracing her husband as if seeking his forgiveness. I was curious too, he admitted to her, not knowing what else to say. He looked at the jar, its lid now back in its place. Not all the spirits escaped, said Pandora with remorse. They both turned to the jar and heard a voice. Keep me with you always, just as you kept me before, said the soft and kind voice inside the jar. Who are you? cried Pandora, her eyes wet with tears. After a few moments of silence, the two of them heard the kind voice speak again, and this time they felt no fear, no pain, no disappointment. I am the one that remains when all hell breaks loose. I am the one you can choose to cherish or to let go of, said the voice. It was soft and calm and filled the two humans with peace and stillness. I am the one that stands by your side if you let me, the voice continued. I am the light in the darkest hour. They call me Hope. The young couple, still frozen in embrace, felt a wave of something good cover them in that moment. Without saying a word to each other, they knew that this one spirit was full of goodness. When you need me, I am here, continued Hope. Just call my name. Hold the jar in your hands and I will be close to your heart. I exist for you and for all mankind. Then we must not keep you for ourselves, said Pandora after a long silence. We must set you free. For all men and women and children must know. They must know the truth that on this day it was I, Pandora, who allowed the misery and pain to enter the world. But they must also know I gave them you. I gave them hope. Set me free as you wish, said Hope. And in return, I will comfort you whenever you need me. I remain your loyal spirit. It was Hesiod, the Greek poet, who first wrote the story of Pandora's jar in 700 BC. We don't know if, when the poet told this story, he was conveying an ideal world before the jar was opened, or 
if he meant that it was better for human beings to know sadness and pain. But we do know that in the original myth, hope remained, and it is this spirit that we need in the world now more than ever. As the story goes, Pandora and Epimetheus went on to marry, to live together, and to give birth to a daughter. That daughter went on to be one of the only surviving humans after a legendary deluge nearly wiped out the human race. Today, we say to open a Pandora's box as an expression of allowing situations to worsen with one small action which may or may not be avoided. Yet, so many remember the evils unleashed on the world when the jar was opened and forget what remained. I wanted to tell you this story tonight to remind you that what remains in the world is there for all men and women to cherish. Hope, no matter how small or dim its light. Hope, when all is lost. Hope, when everything you love is gone. Hope, when you feel there is nothing left. Hope, when no other human being understands your heart. As you go to sleep tonight, your mind may be full of troublesome cares and worries, and some darkness may cloud your vision. But don't forget that no matter what happens in your world, you too can keep hope close, tucked away in your heart, alive in your mind, and present in your soul. And you can pull hope out whenever you need comfort. Let hope reside now, inside your heart. Let hope give you the courage to live with whatever sadness or hopelessness may also be present in your world. Let hope be your guide as you journey now to a peaceful rest. Let it hold your hand as you slumber. Let it guide your dreams, your desires, your secret wishes. Yes, there will be other less joyful things in life. Yes, the world is full of negative spirits and less than pleasurable things. But hope can still remain, if you allow it. Thank you for joining me for this story on Soothing Pod. If you liked this myth from ancient Greece, loved its mystery, and enjoyed the magic, then please come back next time for more. Good night and sweet dreams. I'll be with you again tomorrow. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod's Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to ancient Greece to hear the story of Theseus, the mythical king and founder of Athens, as he embarks on several quests across the beautiful countryside and through the ancient cities of this breathtaking region of the world. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to unwind and find peace in the space that we are in, here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Notice the points where your body is in contact with the bed, how your legs are cradled by the soft, plush mattress how your hips and torso are supported and embraced by this cozy little oasis. Notice how it feels to finally be at rest after a long day. There are no expectations or obligations here. By simply listening to the sound of my voice, and coming on this journey with me, you are drifting 
into slow relaxation. With your eyes closed and your body sinking deeper and deeper into the mattress beneath you, Try and picture a glowing orange light just outside your window. It is an orb that glistens and shimmers, illuminating everything around it in its soft, warm light. It will light up whatever it is outside your window. Perhaps a tree or a bush, or a car, or even just the cool night air. Picture in your mind as the orb gently taps against your window. It lets out a soft tink as it does so, like a courteous knock from a kind old friend. The window magically opens, and with it, comes a cool night breeze that brushes against your legs, making the blankets around you somehow feel even warmer and more inviting. The orb floats into the room gently on the breeze, illuminating the walls, ceiling, and floor in that comforting, warm light. Picture it lighting up the items on your nightstand or TV stand, casting beautiful little shadows on the wall. But then, you notice something peculiar about the orb, something interesting. Every time you breathe in, the orb grows a bit larger. It goes from being the size of a cupcake to the size of a large, round watermelon. And when you breathe out, the orb becomes smaller, shrinking back down to the size of the cupcake. Watch for a moment as you breathe in and the orb grows. and breathe out, and it shrinks. As you breathe in, and the orb grows, and breathe out, and it shrinks. As you breathe in, and the orb grows, and breathe out, and it shrinks. Slowly, the orb lowers down toward your body. With it, it brings a warmth that radiates from its core, like a hot heating pad or a gentle, crackling bonfire. The orb glides down to your legs, hovering just over them. Feel as that light and warmth splashes against your legs, causing them to relax more and more. Feel as the orb melts away any tension that you've been carrying with you. Your legs sink deeper and deeper into the mattress now, completely and totally relax. Then, the orb slowly travels up your body. It hovers just above your stomach and slowly lowers. Feel its warmth as it releases and soothes any discomfort you've been carrying in your stomach or abdomen. You're no longer carrying any nervousness or tension there. All your muscles are completely at ease. Then, the orb continues up 
to your upper torso, covering your arms as well. As the orb lowers, feel your hands relaxing. Feel as your lungs expand, allowing more and more nourishing air into your body. Your breaths are now long and deep and fulfilling, bringing you even more comfort and peace. And finally, watch as the orb travels up to your head and neck. This time, as it lowers, it's not just releasing the tension in your shoulders, allowing them to fall away from your ears and relax. It is calming your mind. Feel as it unwinds any heavy thoughts in your brain and lays them out flat for you, allowing you to manage them with ease. Feel your jaw relax and the muscles around your ears calm. Then, as slowly as it drifted into the room, Watch as the orb drifts off. It heads back toward the window, illuminating the walls, ceiling, and floors as it moves. It illuminates every item on your nightstand in an entirely new way. And then, it's out the window and floating down the street, carrying that brilliant glow with it everywhere it goes. Now that we have taken the time to unwind and find peace where we are, here and now, let us travel to ancient Greece and begin our story with the beloved, cunning king Theseus. Aegeus, the king of Athens, was a powerful, wise man. He lived in his lush palace with hardly a worry in the world. In the morning, he would sit in his palace atop the highest hill in the city, looking down at his subjects and the stunning port in the distance. He loved the way the rising sun painted the mountains on the horizon in breathtaking shades of scarlet, salmon, purple, and red. The way those mountains reflected on the water, looking almost too beautiful to truly be real. His palace had everything he could want the best food in all of Athens, the most wonderful, talented musicians and performers, the finest furnishings that could be found anywhere in the world. He even had two beautiful wives, Meta and Chalciope, who he loved dearly. But there was one thing that was missing from the palace, the sound of children's feet scampering down the hall, the sound of children's laughter echoing through the art-covered walls, filling his heart and his home with warmth. Neither of King Aegeus' wives had yet bore him a child, and over time, that became a grave concern of his. He worried that one of his three brothers would try to overthrow him and take the throne. So, Aegeus set out to try and find some guidance. Desperate for answers, he went to the oracle, hoping she would be able to tell him how to produce a male heir and with whom 
The oracle looked down from her chair, glistening in the moonlight. She had a magical air about her that caused even King Aegeus to feel inferior. With a calm, relaxed tone, she told the king, Do not loosen the bulging mouth of the wineskin until you have reached the height of Athens, lest you die of grief. King Aegeus did not understand the oracle's words. Disappointed, he headed back to his kingdom, wondering if he would ever have a male heir. On the way back to Athens, he decided to stop at treason and consult King Pythias, hoping that he may be able to decipher the message from the oracle. King Pythias understood the message perfectly, but feigned ignorance, hoping that he could procure himself a grandson that had Aegeus's blood. He gave King Aegeus some wine to drink and then introduced him to his daughter Aethra. They spent the night dancing and drinking and sitting under the stars and moon together. And, eventually, as the moon sailed toward the distant horizon, the two lay together. In her dream, Aethra received instructions from the goddess Athena to immediately go to the nearby island of Sveria. So she left the sleeping Aegeus and waded across to the island. When she arrived, the mighty god Poseidon enchanted her and spent the night with her. So, when she later discovered she was pregnant, she didn't know who the father was. Was he a god or was he a king? Aegeus had worried something like this might happen. So, before he left treason, he hid his sword and a pair of his sandals beneath a great boulder. He went to Aethra and told her that if she bore a son, he could, when he reached adulthood, try and lift the boulder to retrieve the sword and sandals. If he managed to get the sword and sandals, then Aegeus would know he was truly his son, and he would be the future king of Athens. When Aethra gave birth to her son, Theseus, it was undeniable that he was the son of someone important. He was the most beautiful child anyone in treason had ever seen. He had a happy upbringing full of love, but it was clear from the beginning that Theseus was unlike his peers. One day, when Hercules came to visit and took off his lion belt before sitting at the table, all the children were alarmed, except for Theseus, who grabbed a heavy axe and swung it at the pelt, thinking it was a real lion. When he came of age, Aethra did as Aegeus had instructed. She brought her son to the boulder and told him that if he could lift the boulder and retrieve the sandals and sword, then he was to be the king of Athens. With ease, Theseus lifted the heavy boulder. Dust and pebbles rained down on him as he hoisted it over his head. When he pulled the sword into his hands and slipped on the sandals, 
he truly knew his identity. And not just that, he knew his destiny as well. Theseus set off on the road to Athens, which was not an easy route by any stretch of the imagination. His mother begged him to take a ship and sail over the sea to avoid the dangers that the wilderness around Athens held, but Theseus refused. He believed that to be king, he had to prove himself as a hero, or no one would respect him. He embraced the dangers that lay ahead, for he knew that he could handle them with ease, even if no one else could. And so, Theseus set out on foot in the sandals that his father had left for him before he was even born. The road ahead of him was, indeed, full of danger, but it was nothing that Theseus couldn't handle. As he walked through a peaceful glade in the forest, surrounded by the beautiful symphony of singing birds, Theseus felt at ease. He had never been this far from home before, but encountering a countryside this breathtaking made him feel as though he were at home. He listened to the sound of the chirping birds, the calls of frogs enjoying lazy days on lily pads floating on the glassy pond. But then, he heard another peculiar sound, a loud thump, thump, thump. Theseus knew exactly who it was before he even entered the glade. Periphetes was a legendary figure he had heard about since his childhood a powerful warrior with the Browns Club, Periphetes took out anyone that dared to come near him. He had never been outsmarted and never lost a battle. But that would end on that beautiful, sunny afternoon with Theseus. Before Periphetes could even realize what was happening, Theseus snagged the bronze club from him. He defeated Periphetes with his own weapon and went on his way, deciding that the club would be a useful weapon on the rest of his journey indeed. But it didn't stop there for Theseus. He defeated several rivals using their own methods he took care of Cenis, the pine bender, who killed people by tying them to trees. Then, he found himself on a stunning rocky road that wound along towery cliffs in Corinth. There, once more, Theseus felt at ease. He watched as seabirds swooped overhead and down into the waves. Wild flowers peppered the space between the road and the cliffs that overlooked the sea. Cottony clouds overhead cast lazy shadows on the evergreen grass around him. And then there was Siron, a strong, rough-looking man who seemed entirely out of place amongst all this beauty. They met on the narrow cliff face pathway where Siron told Theseus that he would not let him pass unless Theseus first washed his feet. Only then did Theseus realize who Siron was. He had heard tales of a thief, a scoundrel 
who would make travelers wash his feet, only to kick them into the waves below to be eaten by a giant turtle. But Theseus didn't want Siron to know that he was onto him, so Theseus knelt before Siron and took his foot as if to wash it. But instead of washing it, Theseus hoisted Siron over his head and tossed him into the waves below, sending him to meet the fate that he had intended for Theseus. After defeating Siron, Theseus continued along the dangerous route to Athens. Every single rival that he came upon, he was able to overpower or outsmart with ease. And not only was he protecting himself, but he was bringing peace for any travelers that would walk the once troubled road behind him. When he arrived in Athens, he thought he would be seen as a hero, the heir to the throne who was finally coming to take his rightful place. However, that was not the case. Theseus didn't reveal his identity to his father when he arrived at the palace, so his father had no clue who this young warrior truly was. But Medea, one of his father's wives, knew instantly who Theseus was. She had a son from a previous marriage that she hoped would ascend to the throne, so instead of welcoming Theseus and greeting him with kindness, she told him he needed to prove his worth. To achieve this, she ordered him to capture the Marathonian bull, which was once captured by Hercules and later let loose around Marathon. She believed it to be an impossible task, but few things were impossible for Theseus. He set off to Marathon, where the bull had been terrorizing locals and causing havoc for several years. With ease, Theseus was able to capture and conquer the bull. The people of Marathon celebrated Theseus as a hero, and he relished in the glory of not only saving the people, but proving his worth yet again. When Theseus returned to Athens to tell Medea and his father that he had conquered the bull, his father was pleased. Medea, on the other hand, was far from it. She proposed a toast, giving Theseus a poisoned chalice. But just as Theseus was about to drink from the cup, his father recognized the sandals and the sword he was carrying and realized who he was. He knocked the chalice from Theseus's hands and embraced his son, welcoming him home. Medea fled the palace, never to return. Finally, Theseus was where he belonged in Athens. And though living in Athens was glorious, it was not easy. Many people wanted to kill Theseus for a chance to ascend to the throne. And there was one other problem, a problem that Theseus could and would not stand for. King Minos of Crete had once sent his most beloved son, Androgeus, to take part in the Panathenaic Games that were held every four years in Athens 
Androgia soon became a crowd favorite, which angered Palantidas, the sons of King Aegeus' younger brother. Palantidas killed Androgeus, devastating King Minos. As a result, King Minos ordered that every great year, which occurred after every seven cycles on the solar calendar, King Aegeus was to send his seven most courageous men and seven most beautiful women to be thrown into the labyrinth in Crete and destroyed by the Minotaur. Theseus disapproved of this horrible ritual. He wanted to protect the people of Athens, and so he set out himself to defeat the Minotaur and put an end to the madness. When he landed on the stunning shores of Crete, there was a woman sitting on the dock, twirling her feet in the cool water below. Her name was Ariadne, and she was the most beautiful woman in all of Crete. She was also the daughter of King Minos, the man who had cursed so many people of Athens to their horrible fate. But when their eyes met for the first time, nothing else mattered. Where they were from and who their parents were was lost in the wind. All Ariadne could do was stare up at Theseus. Her heart pounded as she admired his deep, honey-amber eyes. Her eyes traced along his sharp jaw and journeyed down to his muscles, which shimmered in the light of the slowly setting sun. She could see the power he possessed, the glory that he was constantly chasing after. She was mesmerized by him, and Theseus felt the same. So rarely did he have time to stop and truly see the people around him. But with Ariadne, it was impossible not to. She twirled her feet in the water and looked out over the sunset with such a calm, peaceful energy. It nearly made Theseus forget why he had come here in the first place. They walked toward one another as if they were drawn by a powerful enchantment. They talked on the shore there for quite some time. Theseus helped her up with a kind hand and as their fingers brushed together, sparks seemed to ignite in the air between them. He watched the reflection of the sunset in her bright green eyes as the sun crept further and further toward the horizon. He was utterly transfixed by her, drawn to her in a way that he had not been drawn to anyone else before. Their conversation lasted for quite some time, and when Theseus finally revealed why he had come to Crete, Ariadne was overcome with a wave of worry. She knew how fearsome the Minotaur was, and even if Theseus defeated the Minotaur, he would surely be lost in the labyrinth that had been masterfully created by Daedalus. Wanting the man she was falling for to escape the labyrinth, Ariadne went to Daedalus, hoping to discover the secret of his maze. She spoke to him for hours next to a crackling fire, desperate 
to get an answer out of him somehow, some way. Finally, Daedalus gave in. He could see the resilience of Ariadne and the strength of her love for Theseus. He told Ariadne that one could escape his ever-changing maze if they brought a thread and made a trail behind them, which they could then follow back out when needed. Ariadne was overjoyed with this news. She hurried to the side of Theseus and gave him a large spool of red thread. As she placed it in his hands, her eyes locked with his. She knew that this thread would keep him safe and would bring him back to her. She told Theseus to lay a trail of thread behind him as he made his way to the center of the maze. Theseus thanked Ariadne profusely. Even someone as wise as him would not have thought such a simple trick could be the difference between surviving the maze and not. And so, Ariadne led Theseus to the maze. Despite where they were going, it was a light-hearted journey together. Both of them were so grateful to have found one another that the weight of what lay ahead was nowhere to be found. When they finally reached the stone edge of the impossibly tall maze, Ariadne patted the thread in Theseus's hands. She smiled at him, making him promise to come back and wishing him luck in defeating the Minotaur. Theseus looked into Ariadne's beautiful eyes and promised that if he came out, he would take Ariadne away with him to spend their lives together. With that sweet promise, Theseus looked upon the maze. He took a deep breath and entered, dropping the scarlet thread behind him so he could find his way back when the time finally came. Walking through the maze was a challenging ordeal. The stone corridor seemed endless, and the sky overhead was a hazy gray. But Theseus did not despair. He knew that he had Ariadne waiting for him on the other side, and he knew that by doing this, he was protecting his people. No more would the great people of Athens be sacrificed for the anger of one king. He walked deeper and deeper still into the winding maze, until finally he found himself approaching a large atrium. And lying there in the middle, curled up fast asleep, was none other than the fearsome Minotaur. Theseus thought he had the best luck out of any of the warriors. The Minotaur was asleep, an easy target. But the moment he stepped into the atrium, the Minotaur awakened. He snapped to his feet, towering over Theseus. Theseus tightened his grip on his club and the sword his father had given him all those years ago. The battle was fierce yet short. Theseus glided around the Minotaur with ease and grace, allowing him to get out 
without a single scrape. Finally, he knocked the Minotaur to the ground, defeating him. In that single powerful strike, the future of Athens' maidens and warriors was secured. They were safe. With the Minotaur defeated, Theseus could set out to achieve his next goal. He could take the beautiful Ariadne as his wife. He tugged on the red string with a faint smile on his face, knowing that soon she would be in his arms. The journey to get out of the labyrinth somehow seemed longer than the journey in. All Theseus could think about was Ariadne waiting on the other side, probably praying for his safe return. The red thread slid through his fingers as he wound it in over and over, making good progress through the maze. In all the gray and darkness of the maze, there was that bright red thread of hope. That thread that reminded him why he had done this in the first place. So that all the people who would have been sacrificed to Crete would be able to remain with their loved ones so no one would lose their Ariadne. Finally, he felt a cool breeze wash over him. He knew the exit of the maze must be close. He picked up the pace, allowing the emotions inside him to guide him more and more, until finally, he emerged into the dawn of the day. The smell of wildflowers and cypress trees and the fresh, beautiful ocean washed over him immediately. And then, before he even saw her, he felt Ariadne's arms around him. She giggled with glee as she hugged her beloved, holding him tightly as if she never wanted to let go. Theseus kissed her forehead and looked at her with a warm smile. He promised her that now they would be wed, just as he had said before he entered the maze. After all this, they could be together. Neither of them could wait for the wedding, and so they didn't. Theseus took Ariadne by the hand and led her back to the camp they had established, where all the other Athenians awaited them. When Theseus announced that he and Ariadne would be wed, the small crowd erupted with joyful applause. They were thrilled to see their hero in love with someone like Ariadne. As the sun rose around them, painting the sea behind them in a watercolor of pinks, oranges, reds, purples, and yellows, Theseus and Ariadne took one another by the hands. They stared deeply into one another's eyes as their vows were read before the gods. Standing there, they thought about how truly strange fate is. How just a few short days ago, they hadn't known one another, how their kingdoms had detested one another. And now, he 
here they were, hand in hand, telling anyone that would listen about the love they had for one another. And, indeed, they truly had a lot of love for one another. I hope you have enjoyed this story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, relaxing sleep. Remember that any time you are struggling, you can follow this red thread to a night of rest. Please join us again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and I'm going to tell you a wonderful story that will lull you into a peaceful and restful sleep. Tonight, I'm going to tell you the story of Cygnus the Swan, the name of a constellation gifted to us by the Greeks. But first... Let's take a few deep, relaxing breaths while imagining those beautiful stars. Inhale, picturing the dark night sky, taking a few seconds pause to behold, in your mind, wherever you are, the beautiful panorama of stars. Exhale, as you remember how each of them twinkles in their own way. It's as if they're traveling on different journeys. Yet, together, they create a mesmerizing sight to marvel. You may wonder, as you lie there, breathing in, breathing out, looking up into the vast sky, how all of those constellations were formed. They do appear quite close together, but, In fact, stars within each constellation are, in reality, inconceivably far away from each other. If we continue to look up, inhaling and exhaling, we notice what astronomers call the virtual belt. The virtual belt is where our eyes see the planets of our solar system, plus the sun, moon, and stars moving about. Since the beginning of time, mankind has been trying to look to the stars and make sense of it all. It was the Babylonians who first classified groups of stars into catalogues sometime before 1000 BC. In Southeast Asia, the Chinese empires had their own ancient philosophies and men who read the stars and planets. Yet, no matter what great discoveries science makes about our unfathomable universe, one thing has remained with us through the ages. The names for the zodiac signs and the names of the constellations or groups of stars that look as if they form a distinct pattern or picture. You may be familiar with the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, Orion the Great Hunter, or Taurus the Bull. Recognizing these patterns helps us orient when looking up to the night sky. The ancient Greeks and Romans are responsible for naming many constellations, whose names are still in use today. But I promised you a bedtime story, and that is why we are going to talk about the constellations. Once upon a time, there lived a youth named Phaethon, His name means radiant or shining. 
he was born to a mortal woman named Clemini. As a young boy, Phaeton never knew who his real father was. His mother chose not to tackle this topic until the time was right for Phaeton to know. Phaeton had a best friend whose name was Cygnus. Both boys were as close as brothers. They laughed and played and tumbled together. They learned to fish and hunt together, went to school together, and told each other their deepest secrets. If one boy was in a bad mood, the other would also be found sulking. If one was happy and radiant, the other found a reason to be cheerful as well. One day, down by the river Eridanus, the two boys were talking. Well, I wish I could meet my father, said Phaeton. I wish I could know who he was. Why don't you tell your mother that it's time she told you, replied Cygnus. Well, after all, we aren't children anymore. Your mother should honor your wishes to know, if she truly loves you, and I believe she does. Because of his friend's encouragement, Phaeton finally mustered up the courage to ask his mother. One night, during supper, when the candlelight was the only glow in the room, he posed the question. Mother, said Phaeton, I know you've told me before not to prod you for the truth, but I must know, tonight. Please, I beg you to tell me who my real father is, and where I can find him. Clemini looked at her son with kindness, his dark hair glowing in the candlelight. She took his two hands in hers and kissed them. I shall tell you, my son, but you must promise me one thing. Well, of course, mother, Phaeton replied. You must promise me that once I tell you the secret, you will not go looking for your father. It can only lead to misery. Phaeton wondered at these strange words, but he was eager to know the secret. And so he said, well, of course, mother, I promise. And there is a second thing, his mother said. Do not tell anyone else either. The second promise, Phaeton thought, would be harder to keep. Do you swear? Pressed his mother. Of course, replied Phaeton. He could not wait to hear the secret. Your father is a titan, a powerful god. And his work keeps him away from us. Although, all this time, he has been looking down on you with love, shining his light upon your face every single day, said Clemini. The boy nodded, still waiting to know his father's name. I have not told you all this time because I did not want you to be sad that your father cannot be with us. His work in the heavens keeps him away. He is the one who brings the light to us mortals. Every day, he drives a chariot of fire across the sky on two wheels pulled by flying horses that is seen by all men, women, children, and gods. It is his duty to bring light, for that light brings energy, and that energy is the source of all life that we know. Phaeton's eyes grew wide is my father. Yes, Phaeton, said his mother softly, though the words felt as powerful and searing as the fire on a cold, dark night. Your father is the sun god, Helios. Phaeton could not hide his joy at finally knowing. He smiled, though happy tears clouded his eyes and ran down his cheeks. His mother hugged him tightly and tucked him in bed as she pulled the covers over her son 
she reminded him once more. Remember to keep the secrets I have told you, just as I have kept them all these years. Yes, mother, said Phaeton, and closed his eyes. Now, as you can imagine, Phaeton had no intention of actually not telling anyone who his father was. Certainly it would be okay if he told his friend, Cygnus. After all, he was the one who had persuaded Phaeton to ask his mother, and he would surely want to know the answer as well. The very next day after school, he met Cygnus by the river Eridanus. There, the swans had also gathered, and was sailing past the boys gracefully. The boys watched the swans glide, and threw some bread in the water to feed them. At last, when he was certain that nobody could hear, Phaeton told his friend, Mother told me who my father is. She did, his friend replied. Finally, who is your father? You are not going to believe it, said Phaeton. Well, perhaps, said Cygnus. Try me. I, dear Cygnus, am half deity. My father is the one whom all men have known since the day of their birth. He is the one responsible for bringing us light, energy, and life. Cygnus looked at his friend as if he did not believe that he was half god. My father, continued Phaeton, is the sun god, Helios. Upon hearing this, Cygnus did not immediately laugh, but he did look at Phaeton with some disbelief. He could not imagine that Phaeton actually believed this, for did all women not wish that they were married to a god? Did all young men on earth not want to be as powerful as gods? He loved his friend and did not want to think the story to be untrue, but still, it was quite easy to fabricate and hard to believe. And so he simply said, Phaeton, are you quite sure? This was not the answer Phaeton was expecting. He couldn't believe his ears. He thought for sure of all the boys in school, it would be his best friend who would believe him. Ah, Perhaps this was why his mother was so keen on him keeping it a secret. Perhaps she knew that no one, not even his closest friend, would believe him. Well, of course I am sure, because mother told me so, answered Phaeton. Then his happiness turned to irksomeness. You are just jealous, Cygnus, he snapped because you are a mere mortal, and I am not. I'm not jealous, replied Cygnus, but you must be sure of this before you believe it in full. Of course I would be more than happy for you, dear friend, if your father is indeed who you say he is. What could be better news than that? But as a friend, I must implore you, find out for yourself if what your mother has told you is true or not. And how do you expect me to do that? Said Phaeton. Go to the place of Helios. Ask him if he is truly your father. He will not be able to deny it. Phaeton listened to his friend's words, realizing that perhaps what he was saying was true. He should know for certain, for himself. He should ask Helios to prove his paternity, and if proven, he should be given a place in the palace as the son of a god. And so, that night, Phaeton set out quietly to do just as Cygnus had suggested. Without telling his mother, he set off for the palace of Helios. He had read that it was located somewhere in the east and that by following the point where the sun rose every morning, he could locate it. When Phaeton arrived to the Far East, he could not believe the magnificence that surrounded him. Diamonds, rubies, 
and precious stones lined the roads. It was as if the trees bore fruits of crystals, and everywhere the scent of sweet perfume filled the air. By the time he arrived at Helios' palace, he knew that he was in the right place. For the golden light, tinged with red just hovering over the horizon, placed him in the perfect position of sunrise. As he got closer to the palace, the light grew brighter and brighter. It shone as if it might blind him. Still, Phaeton moved forward bravely. Massive ivory columns held up the entrance to the palace. Phaeton continued walking, in awe, mesmerized. He walked until he reached a diamond-studded throne, with piles of roses strewn around it. Dancing maidens surrounded the throne, and birds fluttered happily above it. And there, sitting on the wonderful throne, was a handsome and powerful, strong and brilliant god. There, in all his glory, sat Helios. Boldly, Phaeton approached the throne. Staying respectful, he bowed low, kissing the ground. He waited until Helios acknowledged him, and until one of the beautiful maidens took his hand and led him up the mighty steps. Who are you, and what do you want? asked Helios, his voice filling the air with warmth. I am Phaeton, son of Clemene. I have been living below amongst men, raised by my mother for all these years. I approach you, O Helios, to see if you do not recognize me, and if you do, declare to everyone here and to my mother, and to the whole world the truth. There was a murmur in the palace, as attendants, servants, and other deities whispered between themselves. For no one had seen this young stranger before. What was he talking about? Look at me, said Phaeton, pleading with Helios. I beseech you, look into my eyes. What do you see? At these last words, the god Helios moved forward in his throne a little. Then a glint of recognition came over him. He rose to his feet, walked down the steps, and came closer to the young man until the heat of his form was overpowering Phaeton. Could it be? He cried. Son of Clamini, you say? The young man nodded before the sun god respectfully, then opened his eyes wide again to see if this god would truly recognize him. I have been suffering for so long, not knowing the truth, said Phaeton. So I am here in your presence today to find out for myself. Answer me this. Are you my father? Suddenly, Helios fell to his own knees and hugged the lad. The god embraced him so tightly that it surprised Phaeton. He wrapped his arms around Helios in return and whispered, So, is it true? After a few moments, Helios regained his composure and answered him, Yes, you are my son, my son. You were the light of my being since the moment you were born, but I could not come to you, for it was your mother's wish. She asked me to protect you, to watch over you with my light, but not make myself known to you. Phaeton could feel rage building up inside of him. But why? he pleaded. Why would my mother let me suffer like this? She knew of my duties to humankind to the earth, said Helios in reply. She knew that I could not abandon them to be with you all the days of your life. She did not want to cause you pain, and so she decided it was better that you not know at all. And you granted her wish, said Phaeton. 
I did, replied Helios. Yet now I see what a fine young man you have grown to be, and I cannot say I do not regret my decision. How can I make it up to you? How shall we spend the time that we have lost together? What do you wish for, my son? Oh, father, cried Phaeton. I wish that the whole world could know the truth. I wish that the boys in school could see me for who I really am and not call me the illegitimate one. He paused, as if collecting his words before continuing. But, most of all, I wish that my dear, dear friend Cygnus could know it first. For it was he who implored me to come and see you. It was his words that gave me the courage to seek you out and to find you. And, in doing so, to find out the truth. Then we shall tell him, smiled the sun god. He took his son's hand in his powerful hand and led him up the great stairs. But first you must eat, for I am sure you are tired and hungry after your long journey. I shall call the maidens to bring you venison and wine. Thank you, my father Helios, but there is no time to lose. I want to tell Cygnus at once, and I want him to come and meet you. Well, if you think that is better, began Helios. I have just the idea said Phaeton. If you would allow me, father, to borrow your chariot of fire, I shall race with it up to the other side of the world where my friend Cygnus is just waking up. When he rises up from his sleep, he will not know if it is a dream or if it is real. But soon he will know that everything I have said is true. I shall pick him up in the fire chariot, race him back here, and we shall all celebrate. I see he is like a brother to you said Helios. More than a brother, replied Phaeton. Very well, my son, said his father. I will grant your wish, but just this once. Go, take my chariot, find your friend, and bring him back to the palace, so we can have a proper celebration and reunion, but I must tell you, do not drive the chariot too high or too low. Stay in the middle course so you do not lose control. Phaeton was overjoyed. What a surprise his friend Cygnus would wake up to. He jumped into the brilliant fire chariot. It was ablaze with light and hot flames, but he didn't feel the fire, for his demigod body was starting to serve him well. As Helios watched him drive the chariot away, a sudden wave of remorse ran over him. For not even the great god Zeus himself would have asked for such a favor. In fact, no god has ever made such a request, to drive his sun chariot across the heavens. And yet, he could not say no to his son. His son, whom he has missed for so many years, he wanted to grant his wish, to show him his love, to give him all that he desired. Back on earth, Clemini was tending her garden in the early morning. She assumed that Phaeton had gone off to school, or at least she hoped he hadn't wandered somewhere else along the way. As she watered her flowers, a blazing trail of light flashed across the sky. She stood up and shaded her eyes with one hand as she observed the strange light moving. No, racing across the sky. Was it a star? But it was too bright and visible in the daylight. Was it a god? Surely no one but Helios would be racing across the sky at this time of day. At that instant, her heart sank. She suddenly knew who it was, racing across the vast morning sky. No. Phaeton, no. She cried, clutching her heart, the tears welling up in her eyes. 
Phaeton could not believe his good fortune. What magnificent fiery horses. His friend Cygnus would be amazed. All the boys at school would be in shock. But his mother, oh dear sweet mother, how would she react? He hoped that she would be happy for him, and happy to know that Helios had recognized and accepted him as his son. As these thoughts were racing in his head, the chariot wheels were spinning faster and faster. The white horses galloped through the sky, and Phaeton cracked his whip to make them run faster, ablaze. He couldn't wait to reach his friend. He didn't notice that he was slipping lower on course. The horses were going so fast, and he assumed that he'd be able to steer them easily. But these were no ordinary horses, no ordinary chariot, and no small feet. Within minutes, the poor Phaeton lost control, and the chariot was careening even more. The horses, sensing that their driver was inexperienced, paid no heed to his desperate calls to slow down. Phaeton tried with all the words he had in his vocabulary to tell them to get back on course. But it was to no avail. The fiery chariot spun out of control, hitting a group of stars and sending them whirling into spirals. Phaeton realized that the chariot would not slow down. But it was too late now. The chariot started causing more and more destruction with every second. It whipped up a whirlwind and caused weather disruptions over many lands. The heat wave, which sank a little lower than normal, caused droughts on the African continent. And in areas which were normally warm, the weather turned icy. Hail and snowstorms, floods and tornadoes. Zeus, who had been watching this whole time, could stand it no longer. Angered that Helios could give in to such stupidity and rashness, he decided to take matters into his own powerful hands. He picked up a lightning bolt and struck the chariot of fire before it could do any more damage. And with that powerful move, Phaeton fell to the earth. His body plummeted and fell into the Eridanus River, just as Cygnus was passing by. Cygnus did not know what the terrible weather dark clouds, fire, and thunderstorms meant. All he knew was that he saw the body of his best friend thrown from the sky and disappear into the dark waters below. Phaeton! he cried. But it was too late. He dove in the river at once in an attempt to save his friend. He held his breath, searching the murky darkness but it was of no use. The body of Phaeton was nowhere to be found. Cygnus climbed back up to the riverbanks and looked around, amazed that the foul weather had suddenly passed and the sky was clearing. There was only a slight drizzle of rain and the drops splashed on his face, melding with his own tears. He cried for his friend, not knowing what had just happened. He dove back into the river, determined to find the body. Only after hours of searching did Cygnus give up and return home. Every afternoon, he would come back to the spot on the riverbanks where he saw his friend's body plummet. And every afternoon, he did the same thing. He would throw himself back into the murky water, plunging into the coldness, trying to navigate the depths of the darkness and find his friend. Every night, he would return home alone. After 30 days and 30 nights of this practice, the gods in the heavens, Zeus and Helios, looked down on Cygnus and started discussing what they should do. 
He cannot go on mourning forever, said Zeus. He only wants to collect the bones of my son's body for a proper burial, remarked Helios. But he has never known that your son was not fully mortal, and that no bones would remain after him upon his demise. So he will go on searching like this, and will never find peace. At least let him find Phaeton, said Helios. Zeus took pity on Cygnus, and decided he would give him a chance to dive even deeper into the water to find his friend. So, he turned Cygnus into a beautiful white swan with powerful wings and feathers. Go, bring him home, said Zeus. The swan dove silently until he reached the bottom of the river. And there, the mourning swan found the body of his friend, lying among other precious and lost things. He carried the limp body on his wings and pedaled upwards with his webbed feet. He kept on swimming, 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 until his feathers skimmed the surface of the river. But there, on the water's singing ripples, he did not stop. The swan rose higher and higher, bearing his friend beyond. The gods gave him strength to fly to the firmament and to take his friend, Phaeton, to rest with the gods above. And, taking pity on the two friends, the gods decided that Cygnus would stay in the dark night sky forever, the embodiment of a swan in the heavens. This way, he could always look upon his friend, remaining close to him, and all the people on earth below could gaze above in wonder. When humans below would look up and see the swan in the constellations, they would know the truth. That it does not matter where one comes from, or how they got there. What matters is the pace of the journey, and that it is okay to journey alone, but it is far better to journey together. To this day, all around the world, people of all nations look up to the same location in the sky, gazing towards Cygnus the Swan. Many cultures around the world have different stories for how the twinkling swan-shaped constellation got there, and many agree that that is the exact location of heaven. I hope you've enjoyed this legend of old. If one night you feel alone on your journey, may you find a little peace in your heart when you gaze up in wonder at the Swan Constellation. Good night, sweet dreams, and I'll be with you again tomorrow. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod's Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to the coasts of ancient Greece to explore the tale of Jason and the Argonauts on their nearly impossible quest to retrieve the Golden Fleece. We'll observe Jason's childhood in the serene Mount Pelion in northern Greece. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to unwind and find comfort in the place that we are in here and now. Close your eyes and allow yourself to sink into the mattress beneath you. Here and now, there are no obligations. There is no to-do list. Here and now, you can simply be. By lying there, 
relaxing and listening to the sound of my voice as we embark on this soothing, safe journey together. You are starting to rest. Feel the comfort of the plush bed and the pillow cradling your body, giving you a place of rest that you deserve. But for a moment, imagine that your bed is not in your room. Instead, your bed is in a forest somewhere. You can hear the sounds of the forest all around you. A soundscape that lulls you closer and closer toward sleep. There's the sound of the leaves rustling overhead, brushing against one another as the wind whistles through them, carrying their fresh, bright aroma on to distant horizons. There are ferns that your bed is nestled between, ferns that ebb and flow with those same gusts of wind, and part as forest animals scurry through them on this brilliantly warm, sunny day. And overhead, you can hear some of those forest animals. Birds seem to be composing a symphony all around you, singing their spring songs into the universe with no reservations and no hesitation. They are not singing for anyone but themselves, filling the air with their joy, their life, their music. The happy chords of their melodies relax any tension and heaviness of the day that you've been carrying in your muscles. You feel lighter, as light as their song. And then, there's the way the forest around you feels. Your hand dangles safely off the edge of the bed, mingling with those bright and beautiful ferns that sway in the wind, kissing and tickling your skin as the breeze urges them toward you. The soft, fuzzy leaves feel like a gentle massage against the end of your fingers, moving in a slow rhythm as that wind winds its way through the forest. Overhead, the sun shines down on you, filtering through those tall, vibrant trees overhead and leaving a mosaic of natural light and shadow across your skin. Your eyes are shielded by a sturdy branch that keeps the sun out of your eyes. And yet, you can still feel the kiss of the sun on your cheeks and face. The warmth of the sun reminds you of sunny childhood days spent wandering the woods and fields and meadows, causing a sense of peace and serenity to wash over you. It feels like home, bathing in the sun like this in your cozy bed miles and miles away from the world. You feel the sun as it warms various parts of your body, wringing any tension out of them. It starts on your face, on your cheeks and neck and jaw. You feel the muscles of your face and your tongue 
relaxing. You feel your teeth unclench, allowing your ears and jaw to let go of any harshness or pressure. You feel your shoulders fall away from your ears, giving your neck the room it needs for a comfortable night's sleep. Then you feel the sun warm your chest. You feel your heartbeat slow to a natural, easy pace. You feel your lungs expand as you breathe a little deeper as that cool, fresh forest air fills and nourishes your body. The sun warms your arms and your legs. Your hands unclench and your legs sink deeper and deeper into the mattress, being cradled and comforted more and more until finally Your whole body feels as though it is being embraced by your bed and cared for by the nature that is all around you. Now that we have taken the time to relax and find comfort in the place that we are in, here and now, let us begin our story. Eisen didn't have much in the world. Once, he had been free to roam the beautiful landscape of Thessaly. He could meander through the meadows as the flower-tinged breeze washed over him, revitalizing him and reminding him of the beauty that could be found in nature. He could look up at the towering cliffs and rock faces, marveling at their height and grandeur. When he was younger, the world was full of potential for him, and his future was bright. But the lure of power and the quest for it was constantly on the minds of the people of ancient Greece at the time, and Ison's half-brother, Peleus, certainly had it on his mind quite a lot. Desperate for the throne, desperate to be the king of Eoclus, Peleus did all that he could to assure no one stood in his way. Peleus banished his other brother and half-brother, sending them to faraway territories where they would be unable to interfere with Peleus' quest for power. But Peleus didn't trust that if he banished Ison, he would stay away. So, instead, he decided to keep Ison close by and keep an eye on him. One day, Ison awakened to moonlight streaming across his bed. Guards entered along with his brother, who looked down at him with a tense, serious expression. He told his brother that only one of them could rule and it was going to be him. Ison knew that such a thing was on the horizon, but he didn't think that Peleus would do it so soon. Within minutes, the guards had Ison by the arms and were dragging him down into the caves beneath the city, where he would be imprisoned for the rest of his life. Ison spent years in prison, and though it was, indeed, a prison, he was not alone. The caves had become a sort of city, 
a sort of refuge for those who were unlucky enough to have met the wrath of Peleus. They were a fairly bleak place, and yet, even within them, light could be found. The granite walls were often blanketed in a thick carpet of evergreen moss that glistened in what little sunlight made its way through the stone corridors. The caves smelled brilliantly of soil, loam, and the salty sea, whose invigorating aroma was swept in through caves that peppered the seaside cliffs of Eoclus, and Ison made a life for himself there. They were imprisoned, but he was not one to go silently into the night. And within that system of caves that had slowly become his home, he met someone who truly was the light he had been searching for. Her name was al Samidi, and she was a beacon of hope in the darkness of the cave. The first time Ison talked to her, the words flowed out of his mouth, surprising himself. He felt utterly connected to her in a way that he had never thought possible. It was as if their souls had been searching for each other for quite some time. And when they met, all felt right in the world, in spite of where they were within it. It didn't take long for the two to become husband and wife. They held a little ceremony in the caves, believing in their hearts that the gods and goddesses of Greece were looking upon them with kindness. Their happiness and joy became even greater when Alcimede fell pregnant with a child. She welcomed her baby boy into the world with a vibrant smile on her face and a heart that was swelling with love. She named the son Jason, and from the moment his parents laid eyes on him, they loved him and cherished him like the little miracle that he was. But there was a problem that weighed heavily on their minds. If Peleus knew that Ison had had a child, he would do all that he could to stop the child from surviving into adulthood. Jason was a threat to Peleus, a potential heir to the throne that he had worked so hard to secure for himself. And so, when he heard that Ison's son had been delivered, Peleus raced down into the caves to see for himself. But what he saw when he arrived were several women surrounding Alcimede and Jason, sobbing loudly about the child who hadn't survived birth. Peleus felt at ease, believing that there was no threat to his throne. But, indeed, there was. Sensing the danger that Jason was in, Alcimede had called for the other women trapped within the caves to come to her side and pretend that the child had been lost in order to protect him. And the protection didn't stop there. That night, Ison and Alcimede cuddled their son in the moonlight, 
they looked at his perfect nose, at all his picture-perfect fingers and toes, and they felt a kind of bliss they had never experienced, but deep within their hearts, they knew this bliss would be short-lived. They could not keep Jason with them. They could not raise their darling son in this cave prison. And they could not let Peleus know that he was alive at all. And so, they did what they knew they had to do. The very next morning, As the sun began to rise over the beautiful coastal city, Alcimide took her son to one of the exits of the cave that overlooked the ocean. The sun splashed across the waves, illuminating them in a pink and gold glow that made Alcimide feel hopeful in spite of what she and Ison had come there to do. At the edge of the water there on that bright new day, Chiron, a centaur, awaited her. He was known by people across Greece for being the wisest and most just centaur to have ever lived. If Alcimide was going to give up her darling boy, she wanted him to be with someone that would raise him well, someone who could pass down good lessons to him and fill his head with kindness and knowledge. And Chiron was the perfect fit. He was known by people to be a good mentor to the youths, a father figure to several of them throughout history. Chiron took the young child in his arms and gave Alcimide and Ison an encouraging smile. He promised to keep their son safe and to ensure that when the time was right, he was ready to come back and be with his family. With that, Chiron set off to his home with young Jason on his back. To Chiron's surprise, Jason did not cry. He did not make a sound. He stared at the clouds and the trees as they whipped on by in a soothing flurry of color and texture. It was as if the baby knew that this was what was right for him, that this would allow his future to unfold as it was destined to. And so, Jason spent his childhood with Chiron high atop a mountain. It was a beautiful and happy home, the kind of home that many people dream about. In the mornings, Jason would awaken to the sounds of the mountain birds singing their soothing song to the universe. He would make his way to the river and wash up, allowing that brisk water to course down over his well-rested body, infusing him with a newfound energy and the promise of the day. Then, he would spend the morning wandering the fields, often He would bring a loaf of bread and a few slices of cheese with him. He would meander through the meadows full of flowers, gazing around in awe at the beautiful world around him. He had always felt connected to nature, 
had always felt in touch with it. So being raised out in the wilderness like this, far away from any cities or any corrupt leaders vying for a throne, just felt right. By midday, Jason would sit down with Chiron and any other students that were cycling through under Chiron's mentorship. Chiron taught him everything he needed to know about the world. He taught him about survival, about cooking, about art, about music, about combat, about politics and philosophy. By the end of every lesson, Jason would practically have stars in his eyes. Chiron was a being who truly understood the world, for both its beauty, its sorrows, and its potential. Learning from him was like learning from an all-knowing God. Jason spent all of his childhood learning from Chiron, and he never tired of hearing him speak. His childhood was the best anyone could ask for, a childhood full of knowledge, exploration, acceptance, and understanding. When Jason finally entered adulthood, he couldn't have been more prepared for what lay ahead. He had known from a young age that he was the son of Ison, that he could one day claim the throne of Eoclus for himself and redeem his father. And soon, he was ready to take that journey. He was strong enough, wise enough. He had proven himself in several battles, tasks, and trials, and Chiron knew that he could no longer keep him in the mountain refuge. Jason was an adult. Jason was ready to become the king of Ioclus. But back in Ioclus, Peleus had been concerned for quite some time. Even though he believed that Ison and Alcimides' child had died, there were still some worries dancing around in the back of his head. He was no longer a fighter. He could not battle for his throne nor did he want to. To soothe his fears, he called upon an oracle to tell him the truth, to tell him if his concerns were at all warranted. The oracle sat before him, cloaked in a long purple robe with a serious look in her eyes. She carried a mystical energy about her. She closed her eyes as the messages about the future and the past washed over her in a powerful wave. And then she told Peleus what he needed to hear. It wasn't exactly what he wanted to hear, but it was something that could guide him. She warned Peleus that he needed to beware of a man wearing one sandal. Peleus informed all of his guards and confidants about this, ensuring that he would be alerted if such a man was to arrive. And on his long quest back to his homeland, back to Eoclus, Jason did, indeed, lose a sandal. 
He was on a mission to return to Eoclus as quickly as possible. But the terrain was challenging. Just as he was approaching the city, as he could see it glistening in the far distance, Jason found himself standing before a river. The water churned over the rocks at frightening speed, kicking up a dewy gossamer that soaked his cloak and his hair. Jason could charge across the river and be in Ioclus easily, but there was something that stopped him, standing on the edge of the river, looking across with a forlorn expression, was an old woman. She hunched over a walking stick as she wobbled toward the water. Jason knew there was no way this woman could cross a river of this magnitude, certainly not at her age. Though he wanted to continue on to Ioclus, his conscience wouldn't allow him to without offering his help to this old woman. He approached her and offered his help, which she gratefully accepted. He scooped the woman up in his arms and carried her across the river feeling the icy chill of the water splashing against his legs. Finally, they reached the other side, only for Jason to realize he had lost one sandal along the way. The woman thanked Jason, who assured her it was no problem. But there was something unusual about this old woman. She wasn't an old woman at all. A shimmer surrounded her, causing Jason to shield his eyes from the incredible golden glow. When he was finally able to blink away the blurriness in his vision, he realized who was standing before him. The old woman was actually the goddess Hera in disguise. She revealed herself to Jason, thanking him for his kindness and patience. A surge of warmth washed over Jason when Hera raised her hands. She told the young man that he had been blessed for his kindness and that he would certainly need that blessing moving forward. Jason continued on the road to Ioclus, feeling empowered by his encounter with Hera. And though he was missing a sandal, he did not care. He entered the city where he had been born the city that should have been under his father's rule, the city that should be under his rule now. Immediately upon entering the city, Peleus's guards spotted Jason, the man with one sandal. They knew as soon as their eyes laid on him that Jason was different. He was the one that the oracle had warned Peleus about. The guards flocked to Peleus' side to tell him what they had seen. Peleus had known this was coming for quite some time, and he had come up with a rather interesting solution to his problem. Jason went straight to Peleus' throne room. He was not there to surprise Peleus or try to wrestle his throne from him by any nefarious means. Instead, he simply told Peleus why he had come. 
as the son of Ison, Jason was the rightful heir to the throne, and now Jason was here to claim it. Peleus listened to Jason's words, fiddling with his fingers against the arm of his throne. He was not going to argue with Jason, nor was he going to deny him the throne. Instead, he told Jason something rather surprising. He told him that the throne was all Jason's. As long as Jason could retrieve the Golden Fleece. The Golden Fleece was a much sought after item in ancient Greece. The beautiful fleece was that of a golden wooled, winged ram named Chrysomelus, whose fleece was glowing with matted skeins of gold. The fleece represented power royalty, and fame in ancient Greece. It was something that only a true king would possess. And if Jason was to be a true king, he would have to claim it for himself. The problem was, the Golden Fleece was far, far away from Eoclus, across a treacherous sea in Colchis, with dozens of obstacles in the way. And once Jason would arrive at Colchis, where the fleece could be found, it wouldn't be the end of his journey. The fleece belonged to the kind of Colchis, a man who would surely not let it go without a fight. But Jason wanted to take the throne more than anything not just for himself, but for his father, to right the wrong that had been inflicted on his family all those years ago. So, he did all that he could to ensure he would make the journey and retrieve the fleece. He assembled a team of powerful heroes Heroes who were well known across Greece for their strength, their noble deeds, and their power. Heroes like Heracles, Orpheus, and Acastus. The crew all sailed aboard the Argo, one of the finest ships ever made. They dubbed themselves the Argonauts, taking the name from the ship itself. When the day came for them all to set sail, they waved goodbye to the people waiting on the shore and set off across the sea. The sea full of magic, mystery, and struggles. But Jason was not afraid. He knew that Chiron had raised him well, and he knew how badly he wanted to uphold the task that had been given to him when he was a newborn. He was going to reclaim the throne. The journey to find Colchis was a long one, and there were several stops along the way for the heroes. They settled on the island of Lemnos for quite some time, an island full of women who had been abandoned by their husbands. The women swarmed the Argonauts, and for several months, the men enjoyed the women's company, fathering children with them and keeping them company day in and day out as the sun rose and set on the island. Heracles, however, did not partake in this behavior and urged the heroes to continue onward toward the horizon to find Colchis no matter what it took. One day, 
the heroes found themselves in the court of Phineas of Salmodeshus. The poor man had been cursed by Zeus to have harpies, which were half human and half bird, steal any food that was put out for Phineas, and as a result, Phineas was starving. Feeling pity for the poor man, Jason slayed the harpies that were stealing his food, allowing him to eat and be well again. Grateful for Jason's help, Phineas revealed a secret to him. There was a single passage to the Black Sea coast where Colchis was located, and it was fraught with trouble. The clashing rocks were a pair of rocks at the Bosporus that formed a narrow, natural strait leading to the Black Sea. These two massive rocks would collide against one another any time that a ship passed between them. Jason and the Argonauts knew that passing between the clashing rocks would mean trouble, but they didn't realize how easy it would be to make it through with one simple trick. Phineas told them that when approaching the clashing rocks, all they had to do was release a single dove. If the dove made it through the rocks, then they were to hurry and also pass through. But if the dove did not make it, their passage through the rocks would be ill-fated as well. The Argonauts reached the clashing rocks aboard the Argo and released a stunning white dove. They held their breath as the dove flew through the rocks and emerged on the other side unharmed. They rowed with all their might, making it through the rocks themselves. Soon after, they finally reached Colchis. The city along the water was stunning, bathed in the glow of sunlight radiating off calm sea waves. However, the king within the city was far from calm. When Jason demanded the golden fleece from him, the king told him he would have to complete three tasks to earn the golden fleece. First, Jason had to plow a field with fire-breathing oxen that would surely burn him to a crisp. Then, he had to sow dragon teeth into the soil. Then, he had to overcome a sleepless dragon to retrieve the golden fleece. Jason was uncharacteristically defeated by these tasks. He had come all this way, and still, he felt that the fleece was further away than ever. However, still remembering his heroic act of helping her cross the river, Hera smiled down on Jason. She worked with Aphrodite to make Medea, the daughter of the king of Colchis, fall in love with Jason. Medea was instantly enamored with Jason and worked with him to ensure that he could overcome the tasks her father had set for him. First, she created a balm for Jason that protected him from the flames of the fire-breathing oxen. As he walked along, plowing the field, not a single flame brushed his skin or burnt him. Then, she warned him of what the dragon teeth would become. As soon as Jason planted them, they would sprout into spartoi, meaning sown men, 
skeleton-like army of warriors, fierce in battle. But Jason was prepared, for Medea had warned him of Spartoi's existence and of how to defeat them. He simply threw a rock at the horde of Spartoi. Unable to find where the blow came from, the warriors attacked one another. Jason didn't have to land a single hit. Finally, it came time to get the golden fleece from the sleepless dragon. Perhaps the most challenging task of all. But Jason was well prepared. Medea gave him a herb potion that would cause the dragon to sleep. With one simple spray, the dragon fell into a powerful slumber. Jason grabbed the brilliant golden fleece from him. The weight and beauty of the fleece in his hands was nearly enough to bring him to tears. He and Medea set sail for Eoclus, where Jason would finally be the king. They threw a festive celebration for Jason's return and to celebrate his accomplishment. By that time, Jason's father was frail and old, wanting to celebrate with him, wanting to see that all those years were worth it. Jason begged Medea to take some years of his own life and give them to his father. With powerful magic she possessed, Medea did just that, revitalizing Ison and allowing him to reunite wholly and fully with his son. The two looked over the city with Medea by their side, knowing that all the hope they had held the promise of a bright future. It was all for a good reason. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story and it has brought you a night of peaceful, relaxing sleep. Please join me again tomorrow for another sleep story. Until then, sweet Dreams. Hello and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to ancient Greece, where we will watch as the country is gilded by King Midas and his magic touch. Before we begin, However, let us take a moment to unwind and find peace in the place that we're in, here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Notice how comfortable the mattress is, how it cradles your body and the pillows cradle your head, giving you a soft place to relax and refresh. Notice how the blankets embrace you, comforting you with their warm, fluffy touch. Here and now, there are no obligations, there is no to-do list. By simply lying here and listening to the sound of my voice, you are slowly starting to relax. With your eyes still closed and your body relaxing more and more with each passing moment, I'd like you to try to imagine something with me. For a moment, try and imagine 
that you are not in your bed at all. You are somewhere else entirely. Your eyes are closed, so you can't see exactly where you are. But the minute you breathe in, you know it is someplace safe and relaxing. As you take a deep, nourishing breath in, you can smell the fresh, wonderful aroma of forest loam, moss, and the citrusy, evergreen scent of cedar trees, basking in the sun on snow-capped mountains in the distance. Nearby, you can hear the sound of the tough, resilient, needle-like leaves with white, purple, and blue flowers brushing against one another as the breeze winds through the bush and laces through the forest. And in the breeze sailing away from the shrub, you can smell the wonderfully rejuvenating scent of the wild rosemary mixing with the aroma of the wild flowers, peppering the nearby fields. It is, perhaps, one of the most relaxing scents you've ever encountered. As you breathe in this aroma deeply, you feel the breath truly fill your lungs. Your lungs expand slowly, allowing that nourishing air to fill your body and go where it is needed. As the air fills your lungs and nourishes your body, your heart pumps just a bit slower, relaxing you more and more. But, it is not just the smells that relax you. It is the atmosphere all around you. That sweet wildflower and herb-tinged breeze washes over your skin, leaving you with the faintest of goosebumps that only makes the other sensations around you more satisfying. The lower half of your body is relaxing in warm water. It's like you're sitting in a hot tub, but the location and the feeling of smooth stone beneath you tell you otherwise. The water feels clean yet wild, like fresh hot spring water. And, as you feel around with your hands, brushing over stones and the occasional pocket of clean, vibrant moss, you know that you must actually be in a hot spring. Knowing this, you sink deeper into the water, allowing it to brush over your shoulders, back, and arms. You relish in the feeling as the warm water engulfs you, relaxing each muscle and nerve that it washes over. You feel the warmth sink into your feet and calves leaving any pressure or tension that you have been carrying there. This warm feeling extends up your calves, over your thighs and stomach. As it does, you feel the pressure melt away there, allowing your body to sink into the hot spring more and more. 
Next, that warm water embraces your hands, arms, and chest. Your hands untense and simply float on the water, no longer in fists or pressed down into the stone beneath you. Your lungs expand a little more as you breathe in that beautiful, fresh air, and your heart beats slower and healthier still with the help of the warm water soothing it. As you soak in this feeling of utter comfort, you take notice of the sounds around you. You hear the leaves overhead as they dance against one another in the fragrant breeze. You hear the grass as it sways in the wind, ebbing and flowing softly. You hear a bubbling creak in the distance as it laces its way through this vibrant, flourishing forest, descending from snow-capped mountains and making its way to the sparkling ocean somewhere in the far distance. The forest is alive with these sounds, and these sounds are the soundscape of your journey to sleep tonight. If at any point in the story you feel you need it, know that you can return to this safe place this cozy, hot spring in the forest, where the water is always warm, and the air is always fragrant and fresh. Now that we have taken the time to relax and find comfort in the place that we're in here and now, let us begin our story. King Midas was not well liked by the people he ruled over in the kingdom of Phrygia. But King Midas certainly liked his life. He lived a life of opulence, the kind of life many people can only dream of having. Every day, he awakened in his lavish castle that sat atop the highest hill in the area. He rolled out of his lush sheets that carried the faint scent of lilac and lavender, picked and dried by one of his many workers. He would then tiptoe across the stone floor to his balcony. A balcony that overlooked the entire kingdom. He would sit there, sipping his fragrant lemon tea, as he watched the sun rise over his lands. He admired the sunrise as it painted the hills, mountains, valleys, and deserts in shades of pink purple, orange, and his favorite color, golden. He rarely thought of the people within the expansive territory that was bathed in the sunset. However, he often thought about how everything the sun touched from here was in his dominion. As he watched the sun rise, he would close his eyes and listen to the sounds of the birds as they sang their song to this beautiful world. For quite some time, he would soak in their melodies, hanging on to every note, every expression of glee and joy. But, after some time, 
the sound of the birds, nature's finest symphony, was not enough for Midas. Instead, he would snap his fingers and his servants would appear before him. They would quickly get to work, playing pieces of music just for him, tuning their harps and other instruments. King Midas would tap his toes as his musicians tried to create beautiful melodies for him. And if they failed, they weren't treated with particular kindness. In fact, King Midas rarely treated anyone with kindness. However, there was one exception to that and she waited downstairs for him at the breakfast table every single morning. His only daughter, Zoe, was one of the few people who King Midas treated with love, kindness, and respect. Every morning, he would walk downstairs and greet her with a hug. She was a beautiful and bright girl, easily lighting up every single room she walked into. Her long ivory hair was often braided with flowers, giving her an otherworldly appearance that only served to remind people of her angelic personality. The two would sit at the table and have their breakfast. It was never a traditional wheat porridge for them, never a simple meal. It was always extravagant, always over the top. As a man of extreme wealth, King Midas demanded the best the most expensive, the most exotic that his servants could find. He often sent them on trips across the lands to find him rare ingredients to cook with. And as he dined on these dishes, oftentimes dishes he didn't even enjoy, he would speak at length to his daughter about how much they cost. Zoe would roll her eyes, but play along. She was annoyed with her father's obsession with wealth and wondered if it would one day pass. But that didn't seem likely because Every day after breakfast, King Midas would make his way down the long, winding staircase. A staircase lined with precious tapestries and fine art that was some of the most expensive you could find. As he walked down the stairs, the dozens of pieces of gold jewelry around his neck and wrists would jingle. And as they jingled, they made the selfish king smile. For they reminded him of his wealth. The only thing that made him happier than the ting, 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 of his expensive jewelry was being inside the gold vault in his castle, which is why he spent almost all his time there. Every single day, without fail, the king would sit upon the piles of coins 
and count out his fortune. One by one. With each smooth golden coin that brushed his fingers, the king would feel a surge of power and joy ripple through his body. Nothing else mattered to him when he was counting his gold. Nothing in the world. His servants knew not to knock on the vault and disturb him, no matter how pressing any issue may be within the castle walls. Some days, the king would even pile the gold into a bathtub and curl up with it, soaking in his riches, the cool feeling of the coins against his skin reminded him of the vast amount of his wealth, of how he would be able to live this life of luxury until the day that he died. And, though many of the people in his kingdom were struggling, King Midas did not seem to care, nor really understand. His primary goal as a ruler was to make himself more gold, not to care for his people or pass that gold on to them. Zoe resented this about her father, but any time she tried to have a discussion with him about it, she was quickly shut down, reminded of all the fine things she had in life as a result of her father's wealth. And she couldn't deny it. She loved roaming the vast gardens on the property. She loved sitting in the grass as her lavish gowns billowed around her. She loved watching her jewelry sparkle in the light of the brilliant morning sun while she sipped fresh juice out on a plush blanket in the garden. King Midas truly believed that it was gold and acquiring more of it that would bring him more happiness. All of his business dealings and all of his energy was focused on obtaining more gold to store in his vault, and more gold for him to flaunt in front of his kingdom. He considered himself to be relatively happy but he knew that more gold would make him even happier. And one day, the opportunity to obtain more gold came upon King Midas in the most peculiar way. Dionysius, the god of wine and revelry, was passing through the kingdom one day and decided to throw a rather extravagant, rowdy party. He was known throughout Greece for being a man who enjoyed a good time more than anyone else. He led his procession of men as they drank and told stories and played music, catching the eye of passers-by in the kingdom. But one of the companions that walked alongside Dionysius, a satyr named Selenus, drank too much and got lost along the way. Tired from the long night of partying and merrymaking, far too exhausted to find his companions, Selenus decided to plop down in the lush rose garden outside of King Midas's castle and take a nap. 
He curled up in the soft grass beneath the lavish, vibrant-colored scarlet roses and drifted off to sleep. His slumber was peaceful and long. As he slept, he swore he could still hear the joyful laughter and singing of his companions as they pressed on and continued their revelry all the way into the mountains far beyond. The sound filled him with peace as he spent some sleepy time in dreamland. When he awakened, it wasn't to the sun rising over him. Instead, he awakened to the feeling of cold raindrops splatting against his hair and running down his body. He opened his eyes to see the dark gray clouds overhead, clouds that blanketed the bright blue sky, casting a dreary haze on the whole day. Directly above him, those bright red roses dipped down towards his face, heavy with the same cold raindrops that had just washed over Selenus's body. The smell of the roses was delightful, instantly relaxing and luxurious. The mere aroma nearly coaxed Selenus back to sleep. But the cool touch of the raindrops shook him out of it, urging him to rise to his feet and figure out how to find his group. However, the urgency of that task was postponed because, just as he was about to rise, King Midas stood over him. For a brief moment, Selenus feared that King Midas would yell at him for sleeping beneath his prized roses. But instead, he simply extended a hand, helping Selenus to his feet. He cracked a joke about how Selenus had clearly had a rough go of it and invited him to stay in the castle for a few days to fully recover. Silenus was incredibly grateful for this unexpected hospitality. He hadn't known the king to be particularly giving or kind in any way, so the compassionate invitation was quite a surprise. But... Selenus enthusiastically agreed. For the next few days, Selenus slept in the castle and spent every waking moment enjoying the splendor alongside King Midas and his daughter, Zoe. He ate the exotic, expensive food and drank fragrant wines from distant lands. He even got to see King Midas's collection of gold, a collection which happened to be the largest that Selenus had ever seen. And then, after several days of living in luxury, it was time for Selenus to return to Dionysus. King Midas surprised Selenus again when he offered to guide the satyr home to ensure his safe and sound passage back to where he belonged. When they arrived at Dionysus's realm, it was, as always, in the midst of a major celebration. Wine was flowing freely, and everyone was laughing, dancing, and having a wonderful time. When King Midas 
approached Dionysus with Selenus. Dionysus was overjoyed. He thanked King Midas profusely for bringing his satyr back to him and for giving him a place to recover while he was unwell, to thank him for his troubles. He offered to grant King Midas a wish of his choosing, any wish. King Midas thought about that for a long moment, after a big pause and much thinking. King Midas had his answer. He chimed loud and proud for all to hear. I wish that everything I touch becomes gold. Pride and excitement washed through King Midas like a powerful wave as he spoke those heavy words of his wish. Dionysus looked upon him, his brow furrowed, his expression troubled. He urged King Midas to think about the wish and the dangers a wish of that nature may pose. But the king remained steadfast. He told Dionysus that there is nothing else in the world he would like more than to be able to turn all he touched into gold. Sensing there was no way to get through to him, Dionysus shrugged and granted King Midas his wish, sending him on his way back to his kingdom. He waved as the king hurried off home, overjoyed by his new power. You will be able to turn things to gold in the morning, my dear king. Just remember that you have been warned, Dionysus said, but he was certain his words had fallen on deaf ears. King Midas slept exceptionally well that night. His plan had worked all along. He had heard tales that Dionysus granted wishes when those who he had lost were returned to him, and he had been so lucky to be given that opportunity. The next morning, when those first rays of sunshine glistened through the window, illuminating King Midas's face, he awakened with a smile. The lush sheets billowing in the soft breeze blowing in through the window, invited him to stay in bed. But he had more exciting things to tend to, life-changing things. King Midas rose to his feet, his mind reeling of memories of what happened last night. With the promise of the wish that he had been granted, Wanting to see if it was true, King Midas reached out to touch his nightstand. There was a magical glint at the end of his finger, and then, in a flash, he watched as the nightstand turned from wood to solid gold. The glint from his fingertips washed over the wood like a wave taking it over inch by inch until there was nothing left but that heavy, brilliant, glistening gold. King Midas exclaimed with glee. His table was solid gold now, worth more than handfuls and handfuls of the gold coins that he had been bathing in. Overcome by pride and greed and joy, King Midas made his way down the hallway, extending his hand and touching everything he passed. 
he touched a water vessel and watched as it was gilded by his mere touch. He touched a rug and watched as the gold ran up each and every thread of the woven wool. He touched chairs and statues and hutches and stands and every bit of furniture that he could get his hands on. When he turned at the end of the hallway to look back at his work, he was delighted to see that there was an entire hallway of gold behind him. It glistened in the light of the rising sun, illuminated to be somehow brighter than the sun itself. It was so beautiful, such a vast wealth, that King Midas could hardly believe what he was looking at. It was utterly and truly remarkable. He made his way down to breakfast, excited to share this power with his daughter. As he paced in the dining room waiting for her, his mind was flooded with the potential that lay before him. He could turn his whole castle into gold. Then, He could charge people even more gold to come and see this wonder. He could make boats out of gold, clothes out of gold, an entire kingdom out of gold. The potential before him was so grand that he hardly heard his servants enter and put breakfast on the table. He was truly living his dream. He meandered over to the table, where his servants had put another luxurious breakfast feast. There were fresh roses in the center of the table. Fresh roses that symbolized so much for the king. That sleeping satyr in the rose garden had led to this. After all, he brought his fingers to the rose excited to take a whiff of the fresh, fragrant aroma that represented all of his success. But, as soon as his fingers touched the stem, the rose was instantly turned to gold. For the first time ever, King Midas was a bit disappointed to see gold. He realized that never again would he be able to smell a rose and touch it at the same time. He would have to absorb their fragrance without laying a single finger upon their stem. Somewhat disappointed by this revelation, King Midas began to pace His hunger rose as he waited for his daughter to come into the room. So, he helped himself to a grape. But, as soon as his fingers touched the grape, it turned to gold. He spat the golden grape out, shocked, and once again disappointed by this heavy revelation. Perhaps... Dionysus was right to warn him. Perhaps having everything he touched turn into gold was not a good thing. Just as he began to ponder on his situation, King Midas heard the footsteps of Zoe behind him. Good morning, Dad, she called. The king turned swiftly to greet her and to warn her of the wish he had made. But it was too late. Just like every morning, she wrapped her arms around him, bringing her father in for a hug. And as she did, that familiar spark ignited yet again. King Midas watched in horror and shock 
as the gold encased his daughter, expanding from the ends of his fingertips until she was gilded and frozen in place. The only person that King Midas loved, his precious daughter, had been turned to gold because of his greed. Overwhelmed, King Midas dropped to his knees as tears streamed down his cheeks. He prayed to Dionysus, telling the god that this was not a gift, but a curse. He prayed that Dionysus would take this horrible curse away from him and help him return his daughter to her normal state. Far away, Dionysus heard King Midas' prayer. He knew the king was a selfish man, obsessed with wealth, and he felt that this curse might have been a lesson. He felt sorry for the king and the immense grief he was feeling. And so, he spoke to King Midas. He told the king that to remove the curse, he would have to find the river Pactolus and wash his hands in its icy waters. That very moment, the grateful King Midas set out to find the river. He didn't call upon any servants to help him, nor did he try to ride a horse or a donkey all the way to the edge of the river. The walk was a long and solitary one, a walk of reflection. The king thought about his greed, and all that had brought him to this point. He regretted his wish. But, above all, he regretted how much he had hurt his kingdom by hoarding all his gold and only caring about his wealth. When the king reached the river, he was a vastly different person from the one who departed the lavish castle. He knelt by the cool water, taking in the beauty of the winding, majestic river that carved its way through the countryside. He bowed his head and slowly, ever so slowly, laid his hands in the water. The moment his hands touched the water, gold began to flow from them. He watched in awe as it trailed off his fingers in golden ribbons, washing down the river seemingly in endless streaks. Finally, there was nothing but a faint flicker at the tips of his fingers, and then it was all gone. All the gold washed down the river, onto distant horizons, off to fill the pockets of people who needed it more. But King Midas wasn't thinking of gold anymore. He hurried home as fast as his legs could carry him, and when he entered his castle, he was relieved that there was no gold in sight. He raced through the corridors, calling out for his darling Zoe. When he laid eyes on her, he wrapped his arms around her tightly and held her close. She smiled and cried as she held her father. From then on, King Midas was a selfless ruler, gave the gold from his vault those in his kingdom who needed it, and ruled with compassion. He found much deeper happiness and joy in caring for his people than he ever did in his selfish and empty gold baths. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, relaxing sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow 
for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to the beautiful land of ancient Greece, where we will join Heracles, also known as Hercules in Roman mythology, on his heroic quest to complete the famous Twelve Labors. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to relax and find comfort in the place that we are in, here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Here and now, there are no obligations. There is no to-do list. By simply listening to the sound of my voice and closing your eyes, you are already allowing your body and mind to rest. Turn your attention to how your body feels on the mattress and the pillow beneath your head. Notice how it cradles you, how it welcomes you to unwind and gives you permission to let go. With your eyes still closed and your body sinking deeper and deeper still into the mattress beneath you, let's relax further and follow our imagination into a different world. Imagine that you are on a boat. It is a large wooden boat. A boat that can withstand any wave that brushes against its hull. The boat itself is full of intricate woodwork. Deep mahogany wood with carvings of the sea and lush fixtures that make you feel as though you are somewhere special. You are on your bed in the center of the boat. Above you, the sky is a calming baby blue, and below, the sea is a mosaic of cerulean, cyan, sapphire, and cornflower. A reflex white in the waves, sea foam that shifts around with the perpetual natural motion of the water. You watch the foam for quite some time as it surfs across the waves, disappearing gradually until it is nothing but a gossamer swept across the water. The air around you is invigorating and comforting. On the briny breeze, You can smell the breathtaking aromas wafting towards you from the islands that you can just make out in the distance. It's the unique scent of the Mediterranean. You can smell the freshness of citrus orchards, the richness of lush fields of herbs, the piney, spicy, refreshing aroma of cypress trees dotting some distant hillsides. It's comforting to have that distance from land, to know that out here the world is yours, while also being close enough to breathe in the scents of the beautiful land beyond. Overhead, white, fluffy clouds meander across the cornflower sky. They are like cottony puffs, lazily gliding over the sea of blue as they make their way to 
towards the egg yolk sun overhead. All around, gulls and other seafaring birds dart and dance through the skies, singing songs to one another and songs to the universe. Slowly, the clouds begin to drape over the areas of bright sunlight. The stunning rays of light fall across you in streaks now, gently illuminating parts of your body. You feel the warmth of one of these rays of sun as it washes across your face. The tender light relaxes the muscles around your eyes. In fact, your whole face begins to relax. Your jaw unclenches and your tongue relaxes, falling into a more natural position. Your shoulders fall away from your ears, giving you more space to breathe. And breathe slowly and deeply. The warmth of the sunlight seems to caress your muscles. Each and every one feels more relaxed. Even your mind grows more at ease. It's as if the warmth of the sunlight has cleared any fogginess or worries within you, leaving your place to simply observe and be. Then you feel the rays of light drift down your body, now covering your arms and torso. The light once more works its magic on your muscles. Your hands unclench, falling onto the mattress, relaxed and in a natural position. Any tension that you've been carrying in your shoulders or arms melts away, disappearing into the mattress beneath you. And in your chest, you feel your breaths becoming deeper and deeper. It's as if the warmth of the sun has thawed them, giving you more space to take nourishing, deep breaths. With these breaths, you feel your heart beat slow to a calm, peaceful level, and any weight that you might have been carrying within your heart or on your shoulders disappears, and you're reminded that it is not yours to carry anyway. The ray of light continues its journey over your body. Now illuminating your legs in that brilliant golden glow. You feel any tension or pain that you've been carrying in your legs fade until you are left with nothing but a comfortable hum. Then the sun embraces your whole body. Basking in it, you feel at peace. And listening to the waves, you find yourself growing more and more relaxed by the second. Now that we have taken the time to relax and find comfort in the place that we are in here and now, let us begin our story. It was a sunny, brilliant day in the 
plains of central Greece when young Heracles was born. From the moment he entered the world, it was clear that he possessed something special. He smiled at his darling mother, Alcmene. Mere moments after he was delivered, and there was a spark in his eyes, unlike anything she had ever seen. She cradled her son in her arms, promising to keep him safe and happy. But little did she know how challenging that would prove to be. Heracles was the illegitimate son of Zeus, the god of the sky and thunder. Zeus was married to Hera, the goddess of women, marriage, and family. When Hera discovered that Heracles had been born, her jealousy and pain got the best of her. Her husband Zeus often strayed, but when these affairs resulted in children, they made it harder for her to forget these transgressions and potentially but her life and the lives of all those in Greece in danger. And so, led by jealousy and revenge, Hera sent two snakes into Heracles' crib when he was but an infant. She knew a child as young as he would be unable to protect himself. At least, a normal child would be unable to. Still an infant, Heracles looked upon the snakes with no fear. Instead of cowering or crying, instead of calling out for his mother, Heracles took the snakes in his tiny hands, squeezing them and preventing them from biting him. Hera was disgusted, heartbroken by this, and she was concerned. It was clear this baby had strength of the gods, strength that would be hard to rid the world of. For several years, Hera allowed Heracles to go on and live his life peacefully. He was raised by his mother in the serene countryside. He spent his days doing chores around the household and being friendly with the other townspeople. He was known for his strength and his kindness, and because of both of those, he was a great help to all the people of his town. Some people whispered that he was the child of a god, but Heracles never spoke of his lineage, instead focusing on living every present moment to the fullest. When he was just a young adult, he fell madly in love with a woman named Megara. The two were wed at a local temple and lived a peaceful, happy life together for several years. They spent long days out in the sunshine together, working in their fields, and spent their nights curled up by the fire together swapping stories and marveling at the vast skies full of stars twinkling above them. But Hera, perched up in the palace of Olympus, in a room of marble and gold, was still displeased and concerned about Heracles. Her jealousy had not diminished 
after all these years. And so, she did the unthinkable. She cast a spell upon poor Heracles, driving him mad. In his insanity, he ended the life of his beloved wife. And when he awakened from the spell that Hera had put him under, he was devastated. Heracles did not care how this fate had come about. He firmly placed the blame upon himself. Desperate to repent for his actions, he knelt beneath the willow tree at the edge of the home that he had shared with his wife. He clasped his hands together, praying to the god Apollo. He asked Apollo for guidance. Unsure of how to move forward, unsure of how he could repent for such actions, Apollo looked upon Heracles with an air of sorrow. He knew the young man did not mean to do this. He knew he never would have done it without Hera's influence. And yet, he knew there was only one way of mending the wrong that he had been forced to do. Apollo called down to Heracles with a calm, comforting voice, telling him that he should speak to the oracle of Delphi. Heracles thanked the god wholeheartedly and began his journey to visit the oracle. Tucked away in a temple, she provided guidance for the gods and for the whole of Greece. Her wisdom and foresight was unmatched, and Heracles felt great comfort knowing that he was in good hand, seeking her guidance. He knelt before the oracle of Delphi. Around them, candles crackled in the dark temple, and fragrant offerings of flowers and incense lined the walls. Heracles knelt before the oracle and asked her for guidance. Oracle placed a hand upon the hero's shoulder, feeling deeply for him. Hera's quest for vengeance was no secret, and everyone knew that Heracles' deed was not his fault. Still, the oracle told him that he would have to repent, and to repent he would have to serve Eurystheus, the king of Tyrans, for twelve whole years. When Heracles knelt before Eurystheus to repent for his crimes, he had no idea what kind of road awaited him. Eurystheus had twelve tasks prepared for Heracles, one for each year. Only, these were not average tasks. These tasks were seen by everyone at the time as impossible to complete. They had never been successfully accomplished by anyone and many had passed on in their attempts to complete them. But Heracles, fearing no man and fearing no task, agreed to do this for Eurystheus with no hesitation. Though he knew the twelve tasks would be challenging, he also knew 
that completing them would allow him to atone for the loss of his beloved wife and his own actions. Eurystheus told Heracles of his first task, to bring him the pelt of a lion that had been terrorizing the hills around the town of Nemea. Heracles set out on the task, carrying nothing but a club and a bow and arrow with him. The sight of Nemea was breathtaking. Mountains encased it, mountains coated in golden grasses that swayed and danced in the wind. There were sprawling meadows of wildflowers that filled the air with a calming fragrance. Heracles wished he could sit beneath the shade of a tree and enjoy the beauty of the day, but he knew the task he faced was great. Heracles tracked the footsteps of the lion through the stunning countryside of Nemea. Every step of the way, through the winding hills, seemed to pass a view more beautiful than the last. He breezed by stunning caves made of blue and silver and grey stone that sparkled in the sunlight. He passed by flower meadow after flower meadow, stopping every once in a while just to breathe in their aroma. He passed by trickling streams, streams where the lion had paused to sip the cool mountain water. Finally, Heracles tracking led him to the lion. He reached into his quiver and pulled out the arrows, getting a good shot of the beast. But as the arrow reached the lion, nothing happened. It crashed to the ground, falling in the dirt as though it was nothing but a piece of paper he had thrown. The beast roared at Heracles, aware of what he was trying to do. Heracles understood why getting rid of the lion had been deemed impossible. Its golden fur was impervious to attack. Instead, Heracles grabbed hold of his club and followed behind the lion until the lion entered a cave with two entrances. The cave was tall and majestic, with large rocks crumbled around it. Rocks that had been there since the earth shifted thousands and thousands thousands of years before, knowing this was his one chance to trap the lion, Heracles piled rocks in front of one of the entrances. Then he followed the lion into the other, giving it no escape. Using nothing but his bare hands, Heracles was able to put an end to the lion that had been terrorizing the people of Nemea for months on end. After being presented with the lion's pelt, the king was shocked. Before this, he had not really grasped the sheer strength of Heracles. Fearful of that strength, the king forbade Heracles 
from ever entering his city again. Instead of facing him face to face, Eurystheus would send Heracles his tasks with the help of a herald. And that is precisely how he sent Heracles on his next task, which was even more challenging than the first. Heracles was sent to defeat the Hydra, a massive, snake-like creature with nine heads that dwelled in the swamps of Lerna. The snake would rise from the swamps in the moonlight and terrorize the countryside, forcing many people to stay in their homes. Heracles traveled to the beautiful countryside and entered one of the many swamps. Moss hung from the trees that rose high overhead, casting shadows on the murky swamp water. He knew the task before him would be almost impossible to complete, which is why he was thankful to have his nephew, Aeolus, alongside him. Heracles lured the Hydra from its den using flaming arrows. Then, once it was finally out to face them, the two worked together to take the beast down. Heracles buried the final mortal head of the Hydra underground beneath a heavy rock ensuring that it wouldn't be able to torment anyone ever again. With that task completed, Heracles met with a herald who told him of his next task. He was to capture the Golden Hind of Artemis. He had to travel to Serenia and return with the hide, enormous female deer with golden antlers, hooves of bronze, which was also exceptionally fast and snorted fire. At first, it seemed as though this would be an easy task. Surely, someone as strong as Heracles could get a deer However, the reality of the situation was much more complicated. The deer was sacred to Artemis, the goddess of the hunt. Wilderness, nature, vegetation, and the moon. If Heracles simply killed the deer to bring it to the king, he would have to endure the wrath of Artemis. Not wanting this fate, Heracles realized he would have to capture the deer alive and bring it to the king. For a long year, Heracles followed the deer everywhere she went, chasing her. After such a long time, the beautiful deer became weary. Wanting a place to rest, she wandered to the lush mountains and prepared to cross a stream. Realizing he may lose the deer if she crossed the stream, and exhausted after a year-long journey, Heracles shot the deer with an arrow. Artemis became enraged and immediately visited Heracles, demanding repentance for the death of her beloved pet. Heracles had no choice 
but to tell Artemis of his task. When she heard what the poor hero had to endure, she was able to forgive him. She healed the wound on her deer and allowed Heracles to take the deer to the king to complete his task. The next task the king had for Heracles was equally challenging, maybe even more so. High on the mountain of Erymanthus, there lived a boar. This boar was a beast of an animal, with long tasks and a bad temperament. Every morning, it would race down from its den at the mountain's peak. Using its tasks, it would destroy everything in its path destroying homes and wagons and hurting anyone that dared come near him. Heracles' task was to bring the boar back to the king alive. So, he traveled high into those mountains where the peak was blanketed with a thick layer of white snow. Below, the mountainside was lush, vibrant with the greens and yellows and browns of a flourishing forest. Heracles could hear the beast almost the moment he stepped on the mountaintop. It was rooting around in the soil, looking for something to eat. Heracles took a chase, forcing the boar into the forest, where it hid from the mighty Heracles. It ducked into the thicket, hoping the hero would go away. Instead, Heracles poked at it in the thicket, forcing the boar to run into the snow. Trapped by the thick, cold snow, Heracles was able to quickly scoop the boar up in a net and carry it back to the king's herald. His next task was the first that didn't involve facing a fearsome beast. Rather, it was a seemingly simple task with the intention to humiliate the great hero. Heracles was ordered to clean King Orgius' stables. King Orgius was an extremely wealthy man with the greatest number of cattle in the country, gifted to him by his father, the god Helios. But this task was harder than it seemed, since the stables were huge and never cleaned before, and he had only a single day to complete the task. Nevertheless, using his strength, Heracles dug long ditches that laced through and around the stables and managed to reroute two nearby rivers to wash the ditches and stables clean. Seeing the ease at which Heracles completed this task, the king decided to give him a more challenging task next. He was ordered to drive away a massive flock of Stymphalian birds that were terrorizing a forest near Lake Stymphalia. Heracles made his way through the thick forest to reach the sparkling lake. But just as he reached the lake, the shadow of birds with beaks of bronze and sharp metallic 
metallic feathers swept over him. Heracles had never seen a flock so big, and he had no idea how to drive them away. Fortunately for him, the goddess Athena saw his dilemma and decided to offer a young hero some help. She descended from Olympus and presented him with a crotala, a noise-making clapper. This crotala had been forged by none other than Hephaestus, the god of fire, metalworking, and forges, ensuring that they would be loud enough to drive the birds away. Heracles made his way to the tallest peak above the lake. He clapped the crotala together driving the birds out of the trees. Heracles then shot many of them with feathered arrows tipped with poisonous blood from the slain Hydra. Heracles' seventh task was to capture the Cretan bull, a bull with a rather dark history on the island of Crete and the father, the famed Minotaur. The strong bull had caused trouble for the people of Crete for a long time. But Heracles was able to take down the beast with relative ease. When he arrived on the island, he first sought permission from King Minos to take the bull away. Then, he captured the beast in a headlock, wrestling it to the ground, and then shipped him to Eurystheus. The bull later broke loose and wandered into Marathon, becoming known as the Marathonian Bull. His next task would prove to be far more challenging. Heracles was sent to gather the man-eating mares of Diomedes. Diomedes was the leader of a Thracian tribe, and he used the power of his mares to rule over them. Eager to complete his task, Heracles sailed across the sea to gather the mares with a group of volunteers. They managed to gather the mares and drive them back towards their ship. But not without Diomedes discovering what they had done. Desperate to have his mares back, Diomedes chased after Heracles and his team, stealing back the mares. A fight ensued, which Heracles easily won with his strength. He defeated the tribe and killed Diomedes, allowing him to escape with the mares and complete his task. Eucephalus, Alexander the Great's beloved horse, was said to be descended from these mares. His ninth task was to obtain the belt of Hippolyta, the queen of the Amazon. The belt was a powerful armor crafted by her father, god Ares, god of war himself. The Amazons were a group of powerful female warriors and hunters who allowed no men in their society. When Heracles and his crew got off the ship, he kindly told Hippolyta 
why they had come. Hippolyta agreed to give Heracles her belt, feeling sorry for the warrior and wanting him to find peace. But there was one person on the island who didn't want peace at all. Hera, disguised as an Amazon woman, told the other warriors that the ship was attempting to kidnap their queen. Enraged, the warriors raced towards the ship, ready for a fight. A great battle ensued between the warriors and Heracles. He finally managed to escape on his ship with the belt, though it was no easy task. Heracles' next labor would bring him to the farthest point he had ever journeyed to. He was ordered to go to the ends of the earth and obtain the cattle of the monster Geryon. Heracles sailed to the beautiful faraway island, and as soon as he arrived, he was attacked by Orthrus, a giant two-headed dog, the father of the Sphinx and the Nemean lion. Heracles fought Orthrus, alerting Gideon to his presence. Fighting a giant with three heads and six arms was a challenge. But Heracles had an advantage with his strength. Using his poisoned arrows, Heracles was able to knock down Geryon and take his cattle. When he presented the cattle to the king, he felt a wave of relief. His tasks were nearly finished. The eleventh task presented to Heracles brought him to one of the most beautiful places on earth. He was ordered to get three golden apples from the Garden of Hesperides. The apples were guarded by a dragon as well as the Hesperides, the daughters of the Titan Atlas. And not only that, but the apples themselves belonged to Hera and Zeus. Heracles managed to find the garden with the help of the Old Man of the Sea, a shape-shifting sea god. When he arrived, he discovered Atlas holding up the sky on his shoulders. Atlas had been condemned to hold the sky above his head for all of his life, a task which he rightfully hated. Seeing this as an opportunity, Heracles offered to hold the heavens for Atlas if he would retrieve the apples. Thrilled to be rid of the weight, Atlas agreed. Heracles held the heavens above his head while he waited for Atlas to return. But when Atlas returned, he was eager to find a way to trick Heracles into holding the sky forever for him. He offered to bring the apples to the gods instead. Knowing this was a trick, Heracles agreed and gave Atlas a trick of his own. He agreed to continue holding the heavens but asked if Atlas could take it back for just a moment so he could put some padding on his shoulders. As soon as Atlas took hold of the sky again, 
Heracles took the apples and raced off, leaving him there. Heracles' final task would bring him somewhere he had never been before. Underworld. There, he was ordered to capture Cerberus, the three-headed dog that guarded the gates of the underworld. Heracles asked Hades, the god of the underworld, for permission to bring Cerberus to the king. Hades agreed, on the condition that Heracles not kill the beast. With ease, Heracles fought Cerberus and slung him over his shoulder, still alive. He brought Cerberus to the king, completing his tasks after twelve long years. From that moment forward, Heracles was forgiven for what Hera had made him do. He lived the rest of his life as a hero sailing on many adventures with other heroes in Greek mythology. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Hello. And welcome to Soothing Pod's Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to a sleepy forest village in ancient Greece. There, we will spend some time with Arachne, a wonderfully talented weaver, as she creates stunning works of art that show people the beauty of the world and the land around them. We will join her on her weaving journey as her confidence grows, perhaps even as her confidence grows a bit too much. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to relax and find comfort in the place that we are in here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Here and now, there are no obligations. There is no to-do list. By simply listening to the sound of my voice, you are slowly allowing your body and mind to drift deeper into relaxation. There is nothing more you need to do. Just close your eyes and join me on this journey. As we delve deeper into our story, you will find yourself more and more rested with every step we take. With your eyes closed, and your body sinking deeper and deeper into the mattress still. Let us imagine something together. For a moment, picture that you are in your bed, but you are no longer in your room. Instead, you find yourself in a clearing in a stunning moonlit forest. Overhead, the full moon casts those silvery rays of light on everything around you, illuminating it in a dreamy, ethereal way. Each leaf on each tree looks as though it has been dusted with diamonds. They shimmer, casting rays of silver and white with every move that they make. Each blade of grass seems to glow as if there is a halo around it. And as the blades of grass sway, they add an air of magic to the environment around you. 
And though the forest is flourishing with leaves, with grass, with smooth bark and craggy rocks, there is something else that is a tad bit unusual about this forest. Something that, oddly enough, makes you feel more at ease. Above you, there are strips of fine drapery and threads of fibers hanging neatly from the branches. It looks like an art project, an art project that has been created just for you. Each strip of cloth that you see is somehow more breathtaking than the last. To your right, swaths of silver and cyan silk stands dangle in the breeze, dancing with every gust that kisses the soft edges. As it flutters, you watch the sheen from the moonlight travel down over the cloth like a wave. You reach up just enough to allow your fingers to brush over the smooth fabric. It is so soft to the touch that you feel like you're touching a cool cloud. Beside the silk strands, there are beautifully woven fabrics that pop against the darkness of the night. The designs woven onto the cotton blend look like something that has been plucked out of a fairy tale. Some of the strands are green and brown and tan, a mix of soothing neutral colors that make you feel comforted and connect to the world around you. Others are bright and bold, mixes of orange and red and pink, mixes that make you feel like you have traveled back in time. You watch these strands of cloth dance and sway in the breeze, so light that they are almost weightless. Watching their untethered motion calms every muscle in your body. And as it does, you become aware of how nourishing and wonderful the deep breaths of air you are taking are. When you breathe in, you can feel the cool air filling your lungs and chest, bringing a blanket of comfort over you. In that breath, you can taste the forest and the peaceful night air around you. The invigorating scent of pine trees, the earthy aroma of the damp soil at your feet. And when you breathe in, you notice something rather remarkable. With the breath you take in, the cloth hanging beautifully from the trees around you moves towards you, being drawn to you by your deep inhale. As you breathe out, releasing any tension or weight you may be carrying, the cloth blows away, fluttering with force of your exhale. You breathe in, watching the cloth come toward you. And you breathe out, watching the cloth waver away. You take a deep breath in, really drawing the cloth toward you as you nourish your body with a fresh breath. And you breathe out, pushing that beautiful cloth away. You breathe in deeply, pulling those stunning cloths in with your deep, full breath. And you breathe out, pushing them into the night air 
as you let go of any tension or weight you may be carrying. Now that we have taken the time to unwind and find peace and comfort in the place that we are in here and now, let us begin our story. Our story begins deep within the countryside of ancient Greece in a peaceful, calm village. The houses of the village were peppered throughout the vast, and lush forest, a forest teeming with life and teeming with inspiration. It was at the edge of this forest that a young baby girl named Arachne was born. The home she was born into was a modest one, a cozy farmhouse where the hearth crackled day and night filling the room and the hearts of its inhabitants with warmth and comfort. Just outside the light, airy windows of the home lay a sheep field. It was lush and vast, a place where the sheep could run and play, living their lives the way that nature intended for them. There were low bushes teeming with berries and fresh, crunchy leaves, a healthy meal that made the sheep in this field some of the most healthy and carefree in the entire world. Arachne's father, Idmon of Colophon, was known far and wide across Greece. He was a successful shepherd and, not only that, a successful dyer in purple. People traveled from across the land to buy wool that had been dyed by him, dyed in many beautiful hues from a bright crimson to a dark purple. In the mornings, he would often take young Arachne with him to gather plants flowers and berries, some of which were used in the dyeing process. As they walked, he would talk to Arachne about the beauty of the land, about how well the land provided for them. Arachne would listen and smile, soaking in every word her father said. He talked about the wool they made and died like it was sacred, and in a way, it was. It was the family's lifeline, their pride and joy, and when Arachne looked at it, she understood just how true that was. It was simply beautiful, breathtaking even. Sometimes, as a young girl, she would sit and run her fingers over the wool, smiling to herself as she did so. It was so soft to the touch, so comforting, and the hues that they dyed it were elevated reflections of the world around them. They were the deepest violet, the brightest purples, the richest and vibrant crimson and red that anyone had ever seen. Arachne would stare at them for hours, blending them together in her mind and painting pictures with the fresh wool. And soon, Arachne was able to do just that. At a young age, her mother taught her how to weave. The first time Arachne sat beside the fire and weaved was a moment that would change the course of her life. With every movement she made, with every loop of the wool, she felt like she had found her life's purpose. 
It was like she was truly connected to the world and to herself for the very first time. Her mother and father gazed at her in awe as she wove intricate works of art. It was like a new language that she was speaking, a language that very few people were fluent in. Arachne found a joy unlike any other as she wove her designs with the wool from her family's farm. Soon, it became all Arachne wanted to do. She would awaken in the morning, just before the sun had risen. There was always a chill in the air, a brisk bite to it that promised her that new discoveries were on the horizon, that there were things to explore and that there was magic in the day ahead. She would shrug the covers off of herself and greet the day with a smile. In the winter, she'd stoke the fire, preparing it for the day ahead, and then head straight out into the fields to collect what she needed for the day. Often, She'd pay respects to the sheep, running her fingers over their wool and speaking to them in loving tones, thanking them for what they provided her family and the world with. Then, as the mist was still clinging to the hillsides and shrouding the mountains, she would go on the hunt for berries and flowers. She'd collect them in a wooden basket piling them up in a vibrantly colored mound. Just as the sun began to crest over the trees, she would begin to head back home. The sun splashed vibrant oranges, golds, and reds across the green grass, illuminating the landscape in a heavenly glow. And that glow that brilliant, warm light of the sun meant that it was bright enough for Arachne to weave. She'd hand her morning bounty to her father, kiss him on the cheek, and scurry off to the place she had created behind the house, a perfect, cozy little spot for her to weave all day long. It was tucked behind the house in the center of a peaceful clearing, a place where she could feel in touch with nature and therefore more in touch with her inspiration and the love within herself. All day long she would weave there, letting her inspiration guide her, creating art piece after art piece without an end in sight. Some days she would create them with specific people in mind, or she would create art pieces that would sell well to the general public. But normally, as the day went on, she was happy to slip into a place of dreams a place where she would weave whatever her heart desired. When she was weaving, it simply felt like breathing to her. It was an extension of herself that she was creating. It didn't take long for people around Greece to hear of Arachne's art. It wasn't just her parents who thought her art was remarkable. It was everyone who saw it. Many of them had never seen woven fabric that detailed, that intricate, and beautifully designed. People flooded the farm to buy her work and 
to give her compliments, and Arachne was far from prepared for such fanfare. She went from being a young girl living peacefully on her parents' farm to being a celebrity of sorts. It was overwhelming for a young girl like Arachne, who had lived a rather secluded life, but there was part of her that enjoyed it. She had never thought her artwork was special, nor had she ever thought of it as a gift, no matter how many times her parents told her it was. Now, with so many people telling her she was talented, Arachne got quite an ego boost. She got a much more confident air about her when she was weaving, and when she sold her work, she was able to sell it for a much higher price. She let the compliments get to her head, and soon, she was acting entirely too proud. But as her pride grew, so did the beauty of her work. It became so beautiful that nearby nymphs would emerge from the forest and the streams and cross through the fields to see her work. They would gather at night when Arachne was tucked away in bed and they would discuss her work. They would touch it and inspect it, trying to imagine how it was possible for anyone to create art so beautiful. When Arachne worked, they would pop out of the woods and watch her. Arachne could feel them watching her, and often, she would even offer them a smile and invite them closer. She liked that the nymphs admired her work so greatly, and truly, it wasn't just her work that they admired. It was the way she looked while she worked. She was so graceful, and there were such fluid, beautiful motions in her weaving it was like she was painting with her body, with the tips of her fingers. Every step of her process, from carding the wool to weaving the shuttle along the loom, was like watching poetry in motion. It inspired wonder and awe in everyone who watched her. One nymph in particular was mesmerized by Arachne's weaving. She dreamed of Arachne one day, teaching her how to weave. And so, in an effort to gain her trust and compliment her, she told her something she wholeheartedly believed. She told Arachne that it seemed like the goddess Athena herself had taught Arachne how to weave. To almost anyone, this would have been a compliment. Athena was a great goddess, and one thing she was the goddess of was the arts, like weaving. But Arachne had more pride in her work than anyone else. She was upset with the suggestion that Athena had taught her. She scoffed at the nymph saying loud and proud, let Athena try her skill against mine. Athena was not a goddess to be tested. In fact, none of the gods or goddesses were to be tested. They were all vain beings, beings that would never put up with being outshined or seen as lesser than by any mere mortal. Saying something like what had come out of Arachne's mouth would put you in instant danger. And, on 
unfortunately for Arachne, Athena was nearby the day she dared to utter this. She had been hunting in the nearby woods, as she did many days, and when she heard this proclamation, she was immediately displeased. Athena was much more forgiving and understanding than the other gods, however, and as such, she decided to give Arachne another chance. Deep within the woods, the goddess put on a disguise. She ran her hands over herself, and in a flash of magic and wonder, she was transformed into an elderly woman. She had a hunchback and carried a large cane. The wrinkles crisscrossing her face told ancient stories, and she knew the disguise was so convincing that no soul would be able to see through it. She hobbled through the woods, completely sinking into the role she had given herself. As she approached Arachne working, she felt a sense of frustration wash over her. Indeed, Arachne was skilled, but certainly no more skilled than her, a goddess. In her disguise, Athena walked up to Arachne. She extended a wrinkled hand to her and placed it on her shoulder. She said in a crackling voice, I hope you shall not deny my advice. You are talented and may challenge mortals as you deem fit, but you certainly cannot compete with a goddess like Athena. I advise you to ask for her forgiveness. She is the most merciful of the gods, and if you are lucky, she may forgive you. Arachne stared at the old woman for a long moment. She shrugged the woman's hand off herself and chimed with utter confidence. I am not afraid of the goddess. Let her try her skill against mine if she so dares. Athena had been patient and understanding with the mortal, but such a direct, unmistakable challenge could not be ignored by Athena. Frustrated and knowing what she must do next, Athena shrugged off her disguise. The mortals that gathered nearby to watch Arachne work gasped in shock as a shimmer of magic surrounded the old woman. When the disguise faded away like a dream, Athena stood in the old woman's place. She donned her armor and her helmet, as well as a tense, focused expression that sent chills down everyone's spine. Everyone dropped to their knees and bowed to the goddess. It was so rare to be in the presence of a goddess, let alone one as powerful and remarkable as Athena herself. Arachne, however, did not bow, nor did she take a knee for Athena. She stared at Athena in a daze, her jaw hanging slightly ajar, her eyes wide with surprise. The only thing she could utter in a low, surprised whisper was, she came. Not much else needed to be said. It was clear what had to take place. Athena and Arachne stood on the sidelines as townspeople scurried to set up a loom for each of them. 
Arachne's confidence had been shaken for a moment as she gazed upon Athena in all of her glory. But as soon as she saw the loom being assembled, her confidence began to grow once more. Weaving was like breathing to her. It was what she had been born to do, and it was something that she truly believed she was better than Athena at. She didn't regret those words she had spoken. She only hoped that she could outperform Athena like she felt she could. The two stood before their looms. There was plenty of wool for them to weave, enough for them to make immaculate, breathtaking works of art unlike anything the world had ever seen. They stared at each other across the clearing, both of them buzzing with anticipation and with the deep, deep desire to create that flowed through their veins. There was no marker to start the competition. No one waved a flag or said any words. The two simply gave each other a confident nod and dug their hands into the wool. With that, the competition began. Both of them slipped into what looked like a trance. They were creating. They were living and breathing the art that they were weaving on the loom. They worked with such speed and perfection that the audience couldn't believe what they were seeing. Their hands were moving so quickly on the loom that they seemed to blur, and the colors coming together on what had become their canvas blended together into what looked like a painting. Arachne did not feel pressure as she created. Even in a moment as tense as the ones she found herself in, weaving was like breathing to her. Her hands and fingers worked tirelessly, dancing and fluttering over the loom with incredible precision. Across the way, Athena did the same. However, Athena was buzzing with frustration, with anger. She hated to do things like this to mortals, but she felt she had to keep them in line to protect her reputation as a goddess. And truly, Arachne had been asking for it by speaking of the goddess the way that she had been. The sun made its way across the sky as the women worked, as it crept from its highest point towards the horizon. It splashed the art with an array of colors, changing it as it streaked across the sky and, in a sense, making it come alive. Soon, the competition was nearing its end. The audience could see both of the women slowing. The colors stopped blurring, and the beautiful painting they had created slowly began to come to light. It was Athena who stepped away and put her hands up first. She smiled at the work she had created, knowing in her heart that it was some of the finest art the world had ever seen. And she was right. Her piece was so intricate that some people began to tear up at the sight of it. It was a detailed rendition of her and Poseidon fighting for the patronage of Athens. With his trident, 
It looked as if Poseidon was stabbing the earth, drawing an explosion of saltwater spring that gushed from the depths of the earth. The depiction of it was so realistic that it looked like seawater was emerging from the painting. A few people dared to even walk up to it and brush their fingers over it to see if it really was just wool. Along the edges of the weave, Athena had placed an olive tree. The olive tree looked like a living, breathing tree, like its branches were wrapping around the outside of the weave and embracing it. People swore they could smell the freshness of the leaves as they leaned into the work of art. And then, in the center of the weave, there was imagery that was far from subtle. There were images of mortals who had challenged the gods, mortals who had fallen on a terrible fate because of it. There was Icarus falling after flying too close to the sun, Salmonius being tormented in Tartarus, and several other mortals being punished for disobeying the gods. People in the audience stepped away from the weave when they noticed this. It made their stomachs churn, not only because of the message, but because of how detailed it was. When Arachne stepped away from her finished work, she did it with a smile on her face and pride coursing through her. But that pride would be short-lived because when Athena saw what she had created, the contest was immediately over. Arachne's weaving depicted ways that the gods, particularly Zeus, had misled and abused mortals, tricking and seducing many women. There was an image of Europa holding on to a bull in the challenging waves as Zeus drove them to Crete. There was an image of Leda brushing her fingers over the swan which Zeus had transformed himself in. The images were so lifelike, with waves and feathers that seemed to move. The audience knew things were about to take a turn for the worse, and almost immediately they did. After seeing Arachne's tapestry, Athena flew into a rage. She couldn't believe a mortal would dare to create imagery like Arachne had. She put her hands on Arachne's head, filling it and her whole body with deep feelings of shame and hatred for herself. Disheartened, Arachne ran from her workshop Later that day, Arachne was found dead, killed by her shame and guilt. Athena thought of Arachne's work. It had been beautifully done, even if the subject matter had been an insult. The world did deserve to see such beauty. Impulsively, she struck Arachne commanding her to live. With her touch, Arachne was transformed into the very first spider. Arachne scurried up the tree and began to make webs in the branches overhead, weaving intricate rows of her silk. Athena watched, pleased with herself, and told Arachne that her 
and all her descendants would learn from this lesson forever. They would weave and weave and weave every day of their lives, thinking deeply about what they'd done. Arachne spent the rest of her days doing just that. She spent her time weaving just as she had when she was still a human. Her webs were like works of art, and every day people gathered to see them. To this day, spiders scuttle into trees and corners of buildings to create, just as they have been commanded to do. If you look closely, you can see the beauty and skill in their work, beauty and skill that has been passed down from their ancestor, passed down from Arachne. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful rest. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. Tonight, I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to ancient Greece, where we will follow the story of Achilles one of the greatest warriors that ever lived. You've likely already heard many stories of Achilles' heroism and wisdom during the Trojan War. So, instead, we will dive into the story of his life, his childhood, his relationships, and his character in this incredibly colorful period of history. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to unwind and find peace and comfort in the place that we are in, here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Here and now, you have no obligation. There is no to-do list. By simply closing your eyes and listening to the sound of my voice, by joining me on this dreamy journey, you are already giving your body nourishing rest. Whatever else you are seeking will no doubt come in time. But for now, be aware that you are already doing enough by lying in bed, and your body and mind are already being rejuvenated with your eyes still closed and your body sinking deeper and deeper into the mattress with every passing second. I'd like you to picture your room for a moment. Imagine the stand or dresser that is near you. What is on top of it? In your mind's eye, can you trace the shapes? Can you feel the textures of the objects around you? Without standing, imagine what the floor beneath you feels like. How it may creak or sound off beneath your light footsteps. Continue around the room, tracing the closet with your mind, the door, and then as you slowly move around the room, scanning it with a slow familiarity. Work your way to the window. Trace the outside of the window a few times. Follow all four edges, moving in a rectangle 
as you trace it around, as you imagine the window. Try and imagine something else with me for a minute. What does it look like beyond the glass? Can you see the stars sparkling in the inky black sky? Or perhaps it is a cool, rainy, or snowy night. Can you picture the snow or rain drifting down? glistening in the dim light. As you picture what lies beyond the window, you notice something peacefully floating just on the other side of the glass. It appears to be a pool of water, a bubble of sorts, floating weightlessly in the air. You can see through the water, including little bubbles and streaks of foam that are swirling around in there. The ball of water itself appears to be moving like a current, swirling in those small circles ever so slowly. The ball of water presses against the window flattening out each instant that it does so. As it presses against the glass, it makes a sticking noise and a pop, like real water would. You watch the water in awe for a long moment as it drips down the window and glides through the tiny crack beneath the glass. Slowly, water comes together once more, forming again into that otherworldly little orb of water that seems to be weightless. The ball of water floats toward the air, peacefully drifting towards you as though it is in a dream. And as soon as the ball of water is hovering over you, it begins to glide down towards you. It radiates a peaceful, warbling noise, like water swirling around in a tiny creek bed or a puddle at the edge of a forest. As the ball of water lowers toward you, a feeling of tranquility washes over you. Gently, the water glides down to your forehead, and it touches you so softly that you can barely feel it. As the water touches you, you become aware of how warm it is, like toasty bath water or soothing water from a hot spring. In its touch, you feel your head and shoulders relaxing as if any tension has been melted away by the water. Gradually, your tongue falls away from the roof of your mouth. Your jaw unclenches, erasing any pressure you may have been holding there. Tiny muscles around your eyes relax. Any busy thoughts or negativity that may have been swirling in your head slowly disappears, leaving you with a manageable, peaceful headspace. Slowly, the water moves down, working its way down to your torso. As it touches your torso, you let out a sigh of relief at the comfort the warmth of the water provides. That warmth spreads down your arms, allowing them to sink deeper into the mattress. A 
and erasing any pain or pressure you have in your joints and muscles. Your fingers unfurl and your hands soften against the sheets. The warmth of the water gently pressing against your chest seems to sink in now, embracing your lungs your heart, the muscles in your torso. You feel that you can breathe more deeply and fully now. You take a deep breath in, savoring the nourishing feeling of that lovely breath as it fills your lungs completely. Your heart slows to a steady, healthy pace, making your body and mind feel even more at ease. Slowly, the ball of water moves down to your legs. Any restlessness you have been feeling in them, any discomfort, melts away, disappearing into the bed beneath you. Your feet and calves relax, allowing you to put the full weight of your legs into the mattress. As leisurely as the ball of water came into your room, it drifts out, leaving you feeling refreshed and ready for the story ahead. Now that we have taken the time to relax and find comfort in the place that we're in here and now, let us begin our story. Curiously enough, the story of the hero Achilles began long, long before his birth. His mother, Thetis, was a sea nymph she was a kind, beautiful woman, with a voice that was so enthralling it could make people fall in love with her with a single song. She spent long days sitting on the coastal rocks, singing into the mist with her fellow sea nymphs and dreaming of what her life would one day become. She would often wander along the seaside, foraging from the ocean's bounty and gazing at the coast in awe and wonder. No matter how many days passed, Thetis never grew tired of the abundance that the ocean provided, at the beauty that it radiated day in and day out. She lived a peaceful life there on the coast, a life where she cared for the earth and the sea with nothing but appreciation and love. However, even in her serene days by the coast, her calm hours spent listening to the waves and soaking in the light of the golden sun, she could not escape the conflict of the gods above. Thetis's first encounter with the gods happened soon after Hephaestus was born to Hera. She struggled to accept her son's deformities and saw him as an embarrassment. In an effort to rid herself of him and the shame she felt, Hera cast her son into the sea, hoping to never see him again. But the young baby Hephaestus was heard by Thetis soon after he was cast down from Mount Olympus. Thetis had been relaxing on the shores of the beautiful volcanic isle called Limnos, 
soaking in the light of the sun and watching the waves move in and out on the white sand. The sound of the rhythmic ocean waves was soon overwhelmed by the sound of a baby crying. Touched and desperate to save whoever the child was, Thetis dove into the waves and wrapped her arms around the young child, cradling him kindly in her arms. She wrapped him in a cozy bed of seaweed and brought him ashore the island. It didn't take long for her to hear what had happened to the child. What the powerful goddess Hera had done to him. Thetis knew she could not let an innocent child suffer due to the will of the gods. Especially a will as selfish as Hera's had been. So, Thetis decided to raise the young child on Limnos with the help of Eurynome, another water nymph. They gave Hephaestus a bright and wonderful childhood, one that was much better than the one he would have received up in Olympus. But this wasn't the only time Thetis would raise a hero or raise someone with great power. Thetis was a great beauty, and the word of her kindness and work ethic had spread across Greece and even up to Mount Olympus. It didn't take long before two of the most powerful gods had their eyes on Thetis, wanting her hand in marriage. From the peak of Mount Olympus, Zeus often found himself looking down to the sea in a daze, admiring Thetis as she wandered along the seaside and spent long afternoons helping those around her. When she sang, he would hurry out onto his balcony and cling to the railing leaning as far over as he possibly could to hear her song. Down below, in his castle beneath the sea, Poseidon was equally mesmerized by the song of Thetis. Living so close to her, he had seen her kindness firsthand, and he was drawn to her as if directed by a binding spell. He found himself dreaming of her. He found himself wanting to do absolutely anything to make her his wife. But when Zeus and Poseidon learned of each other's intentions, they were forced to face one another. Poseidon claimed that he deserved to woo Thetis and have her hand in marriage. They had much more in common after all. Zeus was not used to not getting what he wanted when he wanted it. He coldly told Poseidon that he was to be the husband of Thetis and Poseidon would not stand in the way of that. As they were arguing, a voice from nearby piqued their interest. They turned to see Prometheus, the forethinker and soothsayer, approaching them with a worried, knowing expression on his face. He told the gods, calmly and coolly, that it would be in neither of their best interest to marry Thetis. 
for long ago, there had been a prophecy delivered by Themis, an oracle of Delphi, and the goddess of justice. The prophecy proclaimed that any son born to Thetis would become greater and more powerful than his father. Instantly, Zeus and Poseidon backed away from the idea of marrying Thetis. Both of them clung to their power with every fiber of their being, and they lived their whole lives desperate to keep it. Afraid that any son of Thetis would be far too powerful, they decided to marry her off to a man who had much less power than any god, a human named Peleus. Thetis did not want to marry Peleus. In fact, she didn't really want to marry anyone. But after some convincing from Peleus, and the knowledge that the gods would not wane in their demand, Thetis agreed and was wed to Peleus. Soon after their wedding, Achilles was born. Thetis loved her son dearly the moment she laid eyes on him, and she knew deep within her heart that he would do remarkable things. Every night, she would lie awake as the moon rose overhead. As it cast its silvery sheen over her beautiful son, she would gaze at him in wonder, admiring how precious her baby was. She had never loved anything or anyone as deeply as she loved Achilles. And with such love came the desperate need to protect him. Her experience with the gods had shown her how cruel they could truly be. She knew the dangers of having a son like Achilles, and she truly couldn't bear the thought of losing him. So, one night, she gathered Achilles up in her arms. It was a cool night on the coast of Greece. The briny ocean wind whipped her hair as she made her way slowly out of the house. Careful to avoid creaking floorboards and open the door without making a sound. She knew that Peleus would not approve of her plan, would not approve of where she was going. But she knew that she had to press on regardless. She had to do everything she could to protect her son. She made her way through the forest and nearby meadows. Overhead, the bright moon bled through the treetops, casting a beautiful mosaic of light and shadow on the forest floor below. The thick, plush moss glistened in the moonlight. The sound of the crickets chirping and the frogs croaking around her created a kind of harmony a soothing soundscape to the journey that she was on. She held Achilles to her chest, singing a gentle lullaby to him as they made their way through the forest. Though the situation Achilles found himself in was out of the ordinary, he was smiling. Pressed against his mother's chest, held tight and lovingly in her arms. He knew that nothing bad could happen. He knew that he was safe, 
and her song soothed him even more deeply. Soon, they were on their way towards the underworld. At the edge of the dark forest, there was a cave hidden behind a layer of moss and plants. If you weren't looking for it, you wouldn't even notice it was there. However, those wrapped up in the affairs of the Greek gods were well aware of its existence. Thetis moved the curtain of plants aside and continued into the dark tunnel, into the cave that led to the underworld. She sang the lullaby a little louder to her son, rocking him more in her arms and trying to ensure that he was calm and knew he was safe. Thetis wouldn't have to go far into the underworld to find what she was seeking, because right at the entrance was the River Styx, a river that formed the boundary between Earth and the underworld, a beautiful winding river that was as dark and mysterious as the night. Thetis approached it and knelt before it. She could see her darkened reflection on the surface of the serene water. She took a deep breath and held Achilles over it. She told her son that this would be uncomfortable for a moment, but that it would be worth it. The river sticks would make him invulnerable. Wherever the water touched him would be impenetrable, and he would be able to live a long, happy life, a gift in a world as strange as their own. She clutched Achilles by the heel as tightly as she could. Desperate not to lose her wonderful son in the waves of the river. Slowly, she lowered him into the water. Young Achilles did not cry. He did not even look confused. He simply smiled at his mother as she lowered him into the water. And when she pulled him out, she wrapped her arms around him, wanting him close. Thetis rocked her son and soothed him as she dried him off. She hated to have to do something like this to her son. But as she looked at him, a smile grew on her face. There was a magic sheen that seemed to glisten across her son, as if he was covered in golden drops of the sun. He was glowing in her arms now, and in that moment, she knew that he was invincible, that she had helped save her son. The next few years of Achilles' life were full of love and long sunny days spent in the beauty of nature. His mother and father rarely spoke of the prophecy about Achilles and his greatness and power. They wanted him to be a happy child with a full, loving life. And yet, it seemed that attaining greatness and waging battle were inescapable for him, like they were a part of his destiny. From a young age, he would gather sticks and act out pretend battles in the vibrant green grass of the countryside around their home. His mother would try to shoo him away from it, but his father encouraged it 
knowing that fate would be fate, regardless of their intervention. Achilles' strength and wit were also obvious from a young age. He outwitted many of the children his age, and in his village, he seemed to be the leader of every game and every event the children took part in. His natural abilities to lead and be in a position of power were undeniable. And soon, Achilles wasn't the only child in his parents' house. His parents took in a young boy of Achilles' age, named Patroclus. Patroclus had been an exiled child, left to fend for himself before he was offered safety and love in Achilles' home. Very quickly, Patroclus and Achilles formed an inseparable bond of deep friendship and brotherhood. They spent endless days together, playing war in the woods, identifying plants and flowers, and telling each other stories under the tree shades. On rainy days, they would sit beneath a big oak and tell each other tall tales, trying to scare one another with each clap of thunder. They loved each other, and understood each other in a way that few people get to experience in their lifetime. Every night, they would lie beneath the covers and talk about their understanding and beliefs about the world around them. They found themselves in a beautiful union, companions and best friends for life. But then, when Achilles was nine, it was foretold to Thetis that her son's fate was either to gain glory and die young, or to live a long but uneventful life in obscurity. Upon hearing this, Thetis was absolutely devastated. She did not want to lose her son, to lose the light of her life. And so, she did the only thing she could think to do. She decided that she must keep him from serving in the war in any way possible. She disguised Achilles as a young girl and sent him to live with King Lycomedes and his seven daughters. It was a lush life, a life even more extravagant than the one that Achilles had been living. But he knew that it was not his fate. While the girls were encouraged to forage, to sow, to do art, Achilles struggled to follow those rules. His urge to fight, to grow stronger, to lead. It was all simply too much for him. He often found himself getting in trouble. He formed close bonds with the girls, who tried to help him see that living there was in his best interest. Many days, Achilles found himself dreaming of his life back home. He spent long hours wondering about the prophecy that had been spoken of him. And he wasn't the only one. The Greek army had heard of the prophecy, but they also knew it would be nearly impossible for them to win the Trojan War without Achilles by their side. And as such, they began to seek him out. They spent long weeks and months combing through the countryside, doing absolutely everything they could to try and track down where Achilles had been sent. 
Eventually, they got word that he had been disguised in the court of Lycomedes. The Greek heroes, Odysseus and Diomedes, set out to the court of Lycomedes with a plan in mind for finding Achilles in the large group of young girls. They disguised themselves as salesmen and arrived in the lush court with bags full of jewels and clothing that they believed the young women would be interested in. They poured them out on a table and the women swarmed them, admiring them in awe and turning the precious jewels over in their hands. Achilles, still disguised, was in the thick of it, staring at the jewels from afar with little interest. Then Odysseus and Diomedes set newly made weapons out on the table. They were stunning swords and shields, breathtaking weapons that would make any warrior look twice. Achilles couldn't resist. He took the swords in his hands and swung it around, checking the weight and the power of the incredible weapon. He was practically glowing as he held it, and as everyone looked upon him, they couldn't deny who he was. Odysseus and Diomedes took Achilles by the arm, leading him away from the court of Lycomedes. Achilles went without resisting. Deep in his heart, he knew that he was needed to win this war, and every part of him wanted to fight in it. And indeed, Achilles did fight. Right from the start, he was given command of a fleet of fifty ships. He was the fiercest leader that the Greek army had. There was little that slowed him down, and his wisdom well surpassed his years. Fortunately for Achilles, his role in the war saw him reunited with his beloved Patroclus. By now, they had both grown into men, and they had many, many years to discuss with each other and stories to tell. Patroclus was a warrior leaps and bounds above many other soldiers, and as such, the two spent long hours discussing strategy and their plans to win the war. But, along with that, they often found themselves reminiscing about their childhood days together. They both recalled the long days they had spent running through the serene woods, and the magic moments they spent lying beneath those beautiful towering trees, admiring the way the sun shone on the leaves. The afternoons they spent mock fighting one another, trying to outdo each other in their make-believe worlds. It was a precious time in their lives, a time of their lives that would give them much peace and comfort through their battles of the Trojan War. The Trojan War was a long one. For ten long years, the battles raged on. Achilles was undefeated, winning every single battle that he found himself in. Patroclus was always by his side, encouraging him, guiding him, and offering a listening ear for both strategy and his feelings. But soon, tragedy struck. After being disrespected, Achilles stepped away from battle, refusing to fight. Patroclus took his place in leading his army, and though the battle went well at first, it took a turn for the worst. Patroclus was killed by a Trojan hero named Hector. When Achilles learned of this, he was stuck with grief and rage. He turned to his mother for comfort and support, 
just as she had when she took him to the river Styx. His mother held him and protected him in her arms. She rubbed her son's back and promised him that things would be all right. They spoke of the beautiful times he shared with Patroclus, of the beauty of their bond. This helped Achilles, but he knew he needed more. He wanted to avenge Patroclus, and he vowed to do just that. Thetis, his mother, knew that the prophecy was coming to a head, that her son may meet his end after avenging Patroclus. But she also truly knew that she could not stop fate. In his rage, Achilles struck down Hector. Even after doing this, Achilles' grief made him restless. He refused to allow Hector's parents to bury him. But soon that changed. Hector's parents met with Achilles. Together, they all wept over the senseless loss of the people they loved. They reflected on their lives together, on the joy they had shared with the people they loved the most. Eventually, Achilles was able to let go of his hatred, of his anger, of his thirst for revenge. He wished Hector's family well and sent them on their way. The rest of the battles that Achilles fought were full of a strange peace. He felt grateful for the life he lived with Patroclus and his family. It was Paris, one of the instigators of the Trojan War, who finally killed Achilles. He fired a single arrow that struck Achilles in his heel, the only part of him that was vulnerable. As Achilles passed away, wasn't sad, nor was he scared. He was at peace. He had been a great hero. He had loved deeply. He had fought bravely. And now, he was ready to rest. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pod's Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a peaceful journey of art of music, and of love, as we learn about the lives and powers of the nine Greek muses who inspired artists, poets, musicians, and even gods. We will hear about the lives of Calliope, the muse of eloquence and epic poetry, of Cleo, the muse of history, of Erito, the muse of lyric and love poetry, of Euterpe, the muse of music, of Melpomene, the muse of tragedy, of Polyhymnia, the muse of sacred poetry and hymns, of Terpsichore, the muse of dance, of Thalia, the muse of comedy, and of Urania, the muse of astronomy. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to unwind and find peace and comfort in the place that we are in, here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Here and now, there are no responsibilities. There is no to-do list. 
you are free to just lie in bed and let your mind wander without obstructions. There is nothing else you are meant to be doing or supposed to be doing at this moment. By simply closing your eyes and joining me on this journey, you are already slowly relaxing and starting to rest. With every breath you take in and every bit more comfort you feel, you are giving your body nourishment. Anything else you seek will come in time, but for now, find comfort in the tranquil journey you are about to embark on. With your eyes closed and your body sinking deeper into the mattress beneath you, I'd like you to join me in imagining something. For a moment, I'd like you to imagine that you are still in your soft, plush bed. But your bed is no longer in your room. Instead, your bed is neatly and safely laid in the center of a beautiful clearing in a lush, stunning forest. To the right of you, a small vernal pool glistens in the light of the silvery moon that is full, bright, and dreamy overhead. In fact, the moon is so close, so stunning, that it feels if you could reach out and brush your fingers over the surface of it as if you could feel each crevasse and each mountain that is peppering its celestial surface. The ephemeral pool beside you is created by rainfall. The grass around the edge of the pool sways and dances in the gentle breeze blowing through this peaceful clearing and dozens of specific plants and animals have made their cozy home along the edges of this water. In fact, you can hear some of the animals now. At the edge of the pool, floating on a vibrant green lily pad, a frog croaks into the night air. It's a tiny little emerald frog, so tiny that it's hard to believe it can make such a permeating melody. You see it as its little cheeks inflate and then it lets out the breath much like the deep inhales and exhales that you are making at the moment. But the frog is not alone in its quest to sing its song to the universe. All around you, crickets chirp, creating a pleasant soundscape that you feel almost entirely immersed in. Their bright chirps glide through the chilly night air with ease, echoing off the ancient bark of the trees and sailing toward the tall mountains in the distance. Overhead, an owl hoots into the sea of inky black sky above it. It takes long pauses in between the calls, pausing to wait for a response. It drinks in the brisk air just before it calls out, 
propelling its deep, earthy call out to anyone who will listen. And around everything, encompassing all of the animals, the earth is singing alongside them. The leaves of the tree the owl is tucked into rustle and sway. Below, the soft evergreen grass dances against one another. The steady whoosh, whoosh of their rhythm beating like a drum. As you listen to all these sounds, taking them in deeply and fully, something magical begins to happen around you. You cannot just hear them, but you can see them. The sway, sway, whoosh of the grass drifts up into the air around you like plumes of smoke. With a stunning golden aura that makes the clearing glow, the hoot of the owl drifts out of their beak in notes you can physically see, notes that are a deep sapphire, notes that move slowly and intentionally, just like the owl's song. All around you, the chirp of the crickets pop into the air like bubbles being blown. They are a mix of orange and pink, a bright, cheery mix that beautifully balances the swaying of the grass and the hoot of the owl overhead. The frog in the pond lets out a long, smooth green note that's as brightly colored as it is. You watch the note slide through the air, steady and slow, shrinking smaller and smaller as it glides along towards the trees. For quite some time, you watch this beautiful display around you. This beautiful display of the music of the earth. The soundscape that is being created just for you by the world's most breathtaking orchestra. You watch the yellow mist of the swaying grass and trees overhead. The pinks and oranges of the crickets the green of the frogs croak, croak, and the calming blue of the owl. With each passing moment, you find yourself closer and closer to pure serenity. Now that we have taken the time to relax and find peace and comfort, where we are here and now. Let us begin our story. There are many stories of how the muses came to be. They are such a central figure and so important to so many Greek myths that poets, writers, and historians have spent hundreds and hundreds of years weaving tales about these influential and powerful women. One of their origin stories, and one that reflects the beauty of their nature, begins deep, deep within the wilderness surrounding Mount Helicon, a lush and beautiful mountain close to the north coast of the Gulf of Corinth. To this day, Mount Helicon rises from the rolling hills of the Greek countryside as a mystery, as a spot of wonder 
that ignites the imagination and passion within anyone who lays eyes on it. The soft green hills carved in the countryside around the mountain look as though they are waves plucked out of the ocean, curving up and down into one as far as the eye can see. They give way to the mountain of Helicon, a mountain that rises into a soft, domed point, a green point that seems to glow against the cornflower blue skies during summertime. It is here, in these wild and lush woods, that four springs came to be. First, Pegasus, a beautiful, white-winged horse, was gliding through the beautiful blue skies one day. The divine horse descended into the forest, and as he did, his hooves landed on the ground with some force. The earth cracked below him, and with that crack, an ethereal gold light sprung from the soil itself. The cracks extended across the ground, gliding through it like birds through the air, and slowly, water began to bubble up into these cracks. The fresh water was some of the clearest anyone had ever seen. It seemed to glow even in the light of the sun, radiating a soft blue aura that told passers-by just a bit about the magic that they contained. Slowly, the cracks extended, forming into four springs, one for each of Pegasus's hooves. At once, the springs appeared as if they were as ancient as the trees around them. Lily pads bubbled up to the surface, bobbing on them and inviting frogs to cozy upon them. Plants spread across the edges of the water, providing safe homes and places to drink for the animals of the forest. A waterfall even began to cascade from the cliffside around one of the springs pouring sparkling blue water into it at a slow, steady pace. Pegasus approached the water, gazing down into it with a perplexed expression. As he went to take a long sip of the cool water, however, his confusion grew even more. A woman rose from beneath the water, a woman who radiated an ethereal energy that Pegasus had only witnessed before with the gods. The woman stepped onto the lush grass around the spring with a smile on her face. In her arms, she held a writing tablet a stylus, and a beautiful strung lyre with intricate, breathtaking carvings on it. This was Calliope, the muse of epic poetry. Behind her, the next nymph stepped out of the water. In her arms, she carried a pile of books and scrolls, she did not gaze at this new world in awe. Rather, she was already mesmerized by the books and scrolls she had. She gazed over them in wonder, soaking in every word with a bright smile on her face. 
In her other hand, she held a cornet, a woodwind instrument. This was Cleo, the muse of history. Cleo gazed back at the spring with a smile, encouraging the next muse to emerge from the waves. Erito rose from the water with passion and excitement in her eyes. She had a dreamy, soft look as she glanced over the stunning world around her. The sun rays glistening in the leaves sparked inspiration within her, but not nearly as much as the two birds cuddled up in a nest above the spring. When Erito spotted them, she strummed her cythera with her delicate fingers. As the muse of love poetry, she was already composing something in her head at the sight of the two lovebirds. Behind Erito, Euterpe seemed to rise as she climbed out of the spring. She was the first to pause and close her eyes, taking a long, peaceful listen to the sound of the new world they found themselves in. She smiled at the melodies of the birds and the rhythm of the wind blowing across the spring, of the breeze dancing in the grass. It did not take long before she began to hum to herself, filling the clearing with the very first song of her creation. She carried an alos in her hand, an instrument much like a flute. With her other hand, she lifted pan pipes to her lips, playing a little song for everyone in the clearing to enjoy. As the muse of music, song, and lyric poetry, she was already making her mark on the world. Next came Melpomene. She didn't rise from the spring with the same force as the other muses. Rather, she climbed out slowly, taking her time to establish herself in this strange and wonderful new world. She took in the sights around her with a level of depth and contemplation that her siblings did not. And, unlike the other muses, she did not carry an instrument with her. Instead, she held a magic mask in one hand and a sword in the other. A pair of heavy boots shielded her feet from the soft grass. As the muse of tragedy, she was already exploring the world around her, already coming to terms with the reality of beauty. Behind her, Polyhymnia was the next to ascend from the spring. A golden glow seemed to engulf Polyhymnia as she floated out of the water with droplets rolling off her and cascading back into the spring below. She had no instrument in her hands, and her face was shrouded by a thin veil. The white gossamer shielded her from everyone else, and yet she had a warm smile on her face as she took in this world. This world that she was entirely grateful to be a part of. In one hand, a bunch of fresh, ripe grapes dangled from her fingertips. Not only was Polyhymnia the muse of hymns and 
and sacred poetry, but to some she was regarded as an agricultural goddess. Behind Polyhymnia, it was Terpsichore who sprung from the spring with the most energy of all. Her body moved in a breathtaking rhythm as she glided out of the waves, moving effortlessly much like the water itself. The minute her nimble feet touched the soft ground, she found herself moving to the rhythm that was woven into her spirit. She strummed her lyre with the plectrum made of glistening mother of pearl. With every strum of her lyre, her body moved in perfect unison. The other muses clapped and admired her for the beautiful dancer that she already was as the muse of dance. It was the Laia that rose from the spring next, and she rose from the spring with a warm smile on her face. From the moment she came into being, she radiated a joyful, comforting energy that was completely incomparable to anyone else's. In her presence, the other muses instantly felt a wave of peace wash over them. But not just peace, belonging as well. Thalia smiled at each and every one of them, and as she tried to take her final step out of the spring, she found herself tripping on herself and falling into the moss at her feet. Everyone raced to help her, but Thalia was laughing. Her laugh was deep and wonderful, a laugh that made it impossible for anyone around her not to laugh. The other muses joined in, relieved that Thalia was unharmed. In her hands, Thalia carried a comic mask and a shepherd's crook. The eight muses waited on the shore for the final muse to emerge. And when she did, she wasn't looking at the other muses. Rather, she was already gazing up at the sky. Urania, the muse of astronomy, had her eyes on the cosmic wonder above before she even bothered to look at the world around her. In one hand, she held a globe, and in the other, a compass. With everyone assembled, the muses felt at peace. Though they had just been brought to the earth, they were well aware of why they were here, of the power and ability that they possessed. It didn't take long for the other gods to become aware of their presence, and they were incredibly grateful for their contribution to the world. It is said by some that Zeus and Mnemosyne the titan goddess of memory, were the parents of the muses, whether that was by traditional methods or brought forth by the Pegasus forming their springs from the earth, we may never know. But one thing is for sure, Mnemosyne's powers were passed on to the muses. The muse's role in the world was to kindle creativity and provide inspiration for artists, musicians, poets, writers all around the world. And in their creation,
they would use the knowledge gathered from the world from ancient times and kept by Mnemosyne, the goddess of memory. During their creation of art or interpretation of history and astronomy, they would rely on the vast creativity and understanding of the world that might have otherwise been forgotten. And it was the muse's desire to help everyone tap into this endless garden of insight. Soon, Apollo visited the muses, one of the sons of Zeus. Apollo was one of the highest Olympian gods, and his skills were known to everyone around the world. Not only did he ride on a chariot around the earth, bringing light to everyone, but he was a god of music and the arts as well. When he heard of the muses' creations, he was relieved. The arts were as godly as the gods themselves and humanity deserved to experience them and appreciate them in full. However, without inspiration, without the muses, humans had trouble accessing that kind of magic and having the beautiful experience of creation. When the muses laid eyes on Apollo, Several of them were smitten by him. However, there was more to it than that. They could feel the artistic passion radiating from inside Apollo. They could see his love of the arts. They could see his desire to pass that on and share it with the world around him. And because of that, the muses instantly loved him. Though the muses sprung from the spring with immense skills already, it was Apollo who decided to help them fine-tune their abilities. Rather than bring them up to Mount Olympus, where the influence of the other gods would surely rub off on them, Apollo decided instead to visit the muses every day and help them refine their skills so that they could help humans and gods alike perfect their own. For several days, Apollo would arrive at the springs of the muses just as his rays of sunlight did. The muses would awaken from their springs in the golden glow of the rising sun, soaking it in with peaceful, serene smiles on their faces. They loved watching the way the sun painted the landscape with different mosaics of color, with vibrant pinks, soft lilacs, deep reds and glowing oranges. It was like watching a painting in motion, and it was from this that the muses received some inspiration of their own. They saw that this world provided endless potential for creation. They would listen to the sounds of the forest, the sounds of nature awakening and shaking off the shadows of night. Overhead, birds flitted from branch to branch, singing their beautiful morning melody into the bright, sunny air. The muses found themselves watching the birds for quite some time, mimicking their calls and watching their dreamy, smooth flight patterns through the trees in the thick, wonderful forest. 
just as they had finished observing the birds and the beauty of the sunrise, Apollo would arrive without fail. He spent each day with a different muse, working with them to try and perfect their craft. As a rather smug and confident god, Apollo had assumed this would take some time. But he was surprised to find that within just a few hours, each of the muses were more skilled than he himself was. He sat by the edge of the water with Calliope. She dangled her bare feet into the spring, twirling them across the surface gently to watch the rings and patterns her touch left behind on the calm water. In her hands, she held her lyre, her instrument that had already become near and dear to her heart. Apollo asked for her to strum the instrument and play from her heart. He expected it to take some time for her to play, but as she began to strum, the music flowed from her. But it wasn't music, like the music that Euterpe, the muse of music, would play. It was music to accompany a poem. Calliope sang her smooth, beautiful words into the air. Her poem was so breathtaking that Apollo was nearly brought to tears. He watched her with wide, emotional eyes, amazed that someone could create something of such depth and beauty. They spoke of poetry all day long, well until the sun set. And when it did, Apollo bid the muses farewell. In his heart, he knew the muses were going to change the world forever. And he knew now, without much of his help at all, they were ready to do just that. He told the muses that when the time was right, they would know what to do and where to go. He promised that their service to the world would be worth it, that they were more valuable than they could possibly realize. It was the next morning when the muses realized the true importance of their role in the world. Just as the sun began to rise over the beautiful springs, casting the muses in the glow of that yellow light. A few of them felt a divine heave inside them. They rose to their feet, floating as the feeling of warmth and necessity washed over them like a wave. Terpsichore, Calliope, and Erato were called into the world and they moved towards their calling with a dreamy look in their eyes. Terpsichore glided across the landscape with her heart full and her whole being glowing with confidence. Her head was held high with pride as she made her way to a small yard on the outskirts of a city. A yard where a young girl was dancing by herself. There were tears in her eyes. Terpsichore could tell she had just been in a fight with her parents, that she was wounded and feeling vulnerable. She sat beside the girl and whispered to her, encouraging her to let go of pain, reminding her that it wasn't hers to carry and that she could feel joy again. Slowly, the young girl began to dance. 
with every elegant move her body made to the music of nature around her, the tears lessened. Her gloomy, wounded expression was replaced by a bright, glowing smile. She was lost in the music inside herself, lost in the movements of her dancing and the freedom it provided her with. Terpsichore smiled to herself. A warm feeling coursed through her body as she gazed at the young girl, knowing that she had helped her find the art, and the art had helped her heal. Meanwhile, Calliope found herself swaying outside the window of a young woman. Her kids ran and played out in the yard, and the woman watched them with a sense of longing and nostalgia. She seemed run down, tired, and in that, Calliope knew she needed to find peace. Calliope whispered in the woman's ear and nudged her ink toward her. Slowly, the woman began to write on her paper. At first, her fingers were hesitant, unsure, but soon they were flowing effortlessly. The words poured out of her as she put her thoughts on paper, words describing extraordinary deeds of extraordinary characters, and as she put them on paper, her shoulders dropped with relaxation. All the tension melted out of her body. Calliope could see that this release, this poem, had given her exactly what she needed. On the other side of town, deep within the city, Erito stood by the bedside of a man struggling with grief. He missed his wife greatly and as such, was struggling to get out of bed. Erito held his hand and whispered to him, passing on hopeful messages and inspiration as she spoke of love. The man slowly stood up, feeling inspired, and began to write a poem to his lost love. With every word, his eyes filled with tears. Not tears of pain, but tears of relief. He had found comfort in writing to her. The muses returned to the spring. As they did, the importance of their roles in the world became clear to them. To this day, the muses still visit us, filling us with inspiration and reminding us of the importance of creating. Whenever we are struggling, we can choose to remember that they are by our side, encouraging us and helping us let go. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. Please join me again tomorrow for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Hello and welcome to Soothing Pods sleep stories. My name is Chris, and tonight I will be your guide as we dive beneath the dark, mysterious, and beautiful waves of the Mediterranean Sea. In this scary sleep story, you will learn all about the myths of ancient Greece that informed the people's decisions, and helped them explain the strange world 
around them. If you enjoy listening to scary sleep stories, this story will help lull you towards a night of peaceful, restful sleep. If you don't find stories of monsters and sea creatures soothing, please choose a different story from a variety of genres and topics on the Soothing Pod channel. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to relax and find comfort in the place that we are in. Here and now, close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Right now, there are no expectations. There is no to-do list. By simply listening to the sound of my voice, you are already giving your body the rest and nourishment that it needs. Anything else that you are seeking will come soon after. But in this moment, let's find comfort in the fact that by embarking on this journey with me, you are getting calmer and more relaxed with each passing moment. With your eyes closed, take a deep breath as you sink deeper and deeper into the mattress. Really turn your attention to the comfort of your mattress, the way it cradles your body and invites you to let go of any tension you've gathered throughout the day and any weight that you are carrying which may not be yours to shoulder. Notice the comfort of the pillow or mattress beneath your head, providing a safe place to lie and refresh. Imagine that you are still in your cozy bed, but your bed is no longer in your room. Instead, you find yourself on the edge of the ocean. Gaze around, taking in the beautiful sights that are all around you. It is not a warm summer day. It appears to be late autumn. You are in a cozy, rocky cove on the coast of a distant sea. The sand that your bed is set on is a half-moon shape, surrounded by rocky cliffs on either side. The rocky cliffs are dotted with lofty pine trees that fill the brisk air with their citrusy, invigorating aroma. And that is not the only beautiful scent in the air. All around you, a low fog clings to the rocky cliff sides and hovers just over the dark water. The thick mist makes you feel as though you are in a storybook, and it adds a sense of comfort to the atmosphere. You feel like the world is just putting on this beautiful display for you. In the mist, you can smell the brilliant scents of the coast. You can smell the spirited wildflowers blooming in tiny nooks in the cliffs. Their delicate floral scent, nearly overpowered by the aroma of the salty sea air. And that sea air is invigorating in itself. It causes you to breathe more deeply and more fully. And with each breath, 
you feel like you are being rejuvenated. The brisk aroma of the ocean fills your lungs as well. The briny smell of the cool ocean somehow reminding you of both warm days by the coast and eternal sleepiness of the rain. Almost like the autumn day today. With every breath you take, you find yourself sinking deeper into the mattress, becoming more relaxed. And it is not only because of the fresh air in your lungs, but also because of the ocean waves slowly lapping the shore. You listen to their soothing sound as they rise up onto the sand then disappear back into the sea, becoming one with the ocean yet again. There is a satisfying pop and fizzle as the waves reach their crescendo, stretching and reaching as far as they can onto the coastline, and a steady whoosh as they retreat back to the sea relaxing into themselves again. Overhead, seagulls cool out into the fog, their mewing mixing in with the sound of the waves, creating a soundscape for this sleepy beach day. As you slowly breathe in, you notice the fog that's clinging to the coastline getting thicker. It goes from a nearly translucent haze to a thick, cool blanket of mist. As you breathe out, you watch as the fog dissipates into that gossamer, disappearing into the sea. You breathe in deeply as the fog grows thicker around you. The thickness of the fog makes the breath you take even more nourishing and refreshing. You can taste the salt of the sea, the freshness of the air. As you hold that breath, you watch the fog shimmer in front of you. And as you breathe out, you watch the fog start to dissipate as it and you relax. You breathe in, watching the fog grow thicker and turning into a plush blanket. And you breathe out, watching the fog dissipate into the pretty little gossamer. You breathe in, watching the fog grow thicker and you breathe out, watching it disappear. Now that we have taken the time to unwind and find comfort in the place that we are in here and now, let us begin our sleep story on the coast of ancient Greece. The ancient Greeks had an undeniable bond with the ocean. They were tied to one another, so much so that a seemingly endless number of myths and stories are tied to seafaring, adventure, the beauty of the ocean, and the dangers that lurked beneath it. There are myths of heroes like Perseus sailing across the sea on an odyssey, myths of gods inexplicably connected to the ocean, and tales of sailors searching for promise on the other side of the horizon. But within all these myths and stories, there are tales about the creatures beneath the waves, tales of sirens, of Kraken, of Calypso and Circe, and many others. And today, 
we will follow a path to some of them. First, we will begin with the sirens, and that will take us to some rocky Greek islands on a foggy, cool night. When the Greek sailors set out onto the ocean, they were not sure how long it would be before they would return to the shore. They had wives back home, and if their journeys lasted much longer than expected, they often found themselves craving the beauty of the solid ground. The ocean around them seemed to stretch endlessly for miles, and after a while, they were itching for the thrill and comfort of the world on distant shores. They craved art, fun, and beauty. And often, they would find it in strange places. On days when they could hardly see a few feet ahead of their ship, through a curtain of thick, mesmerizing fog, they would pace aboard the ship, dreaming of the land. There was always a strange feeling in the air, and curiosity about what was lurking in the fog. Whenever they found themselves wondering about it, they would try to shrug it off. They would tell themselves it was just the waves just more islands in the far, far distance. But the odd, unlucky ship would initially hear something in the distance. At first, it would almost sound like birds chirping, singing their song out across the ocean. The sailors would shrug imagining that they had simply floated closer to an island than they imagined. But soon, the sounds of the birds chirping would change into something much more alluring. They would hear beautiful female voices singing. Their songs were truly music to the sailors' ears. The delightful, ethereal melodies seemed to dance through the fog, sweet as honey as they reached the tired sailors. They would feel their whole bodies relax as they were wrapped in the warm, comforting melody, a melody that made them feel completely and utterly at peace. But the melody was so hauntingly beautiful that they were drawn to it. There wasn't a sailor on the ship who didn't want to follow the sound, who didn't want to see the beautiful maiden that was weaving the music just for them. And so, the ship would journey towards the music. At first, it would be hard to quite pinpoint it, but soon, the music would grow louder and louder. The sailors would all gather at the front of the ship, their knees weak and their bodies melting like putty because they felt so utterly serene. The song seemed to wrap around them, offering them a safe place to lay their heads after so many long days out on the sea. They would find themselves seemingly in the midst of the music, so close to it that they could feel it in their bodies. They would look over the bow of the ship, trying to catch even a single glimpse of the women 
who were singing. But just as they tried to look, the ship would be rattled. They were run aground, so desperate to see who was singing to them, that they sailed the boat directly into a craggy, unforgiving coast as the sailors looked around in surprise the song would grow louder because it wasn't maidens singing the song but sirens the sirens would attack the crew keeping them from completing their journey there are varying myths about what exactly the sirens looked like. Some ancient Greek writers depicted them as beautiful women, with long flowing hair, silky skin, and gentle eyes. Others described them as stunning women, with a human head and a bird-like body. Regardless, All sources agree that the sirens had a voice so beautiful it could lure even the most steadfast sailor into their trap. Although, there were some Greek heroes who were prepared to face the sirens. Following the Trojan War, the great hero Odysseus and his crew passed through choppy waters on their voyage home to Ithaca. They had heard tales that the sirens resided in the cold water in a pass they were forced to sail through. Odysseus was a hero known for his wisdom and wit, and as such, he was confident that the sirens were no match for him. In order to avoid falling prey to the sirens' calls, Odysseus made a plan. As the mist around them grew, encompassing the crew in the thick fog, Odysseus called upon his men. He ordered them to tie him to the mast at the center of the ship, where he would be left immobile unable to react to the siren's song. However, he knew his crew had to be taken care of as well. He ordered the crew to go to the candles that were burning all around the ship. There, they were to gather wax and mold it to fit in their ears so that they could block out the siren's singing. The crew did as they were told. Together, they pressed Odysseus up against the mast and tied thick ropes firmly around him. Odysseus wiggled a bit to ensure that he could not break free from the ropes, even if he tried with all his might. After he proved that the ropes were strong enough to hold him, His crew got to work picking wax from candles. By then, the fog had grown and splashed over the ship like a powerful wave. The white haze was so thick they could barely see the flickering candlelight beckoning to them. They dipped their fingers into the warm wax then rubbed their fingertips together until they created a roll of the white wax that was thick enough to block the song of the sirens. With everyone in place and the wax safely blocking any sound, they continued on into the fog. As they neared the sirens, through the turbulent waves. The sirens began to sing 
their hauntingly beautiful song. It was a song so stunning, so breathtaking, that it could bring a tear to your eye with ease. But the crew remained steadfast, staring straight ahead as they piloted the ship forward in silence. Odysseus heard the song, however, and it was, without a doubt, the most incredibly heart-stopping, breathtaking music that he had ever heard in his life. The music seemed to sink into his skin and dance with his mind and soul. He had never felt such an overpowering connection to anything before. It was as if it was the music of the universe. Music that everyone was meant to hear. He was desperate to get closer to it, to see the lips of the maidens it was coming from. But he was tied to the mast. It was a long wait before they were out of the fog. The boat seemed to move through the thick water, as if it was slinking through a sea of molasses. But eventually, as time moved on, the siren song drifted further and further into the background. Soon, the crew was in the clear. They removed the wax from their ears and cheered, relieved to have escaped the clutches of the beautiful but deadly sirens. They untied Odysseus, who gazed back into the fog that was falling further and further behind them. For the rest of his life, he would carry the beauty of the siren's song. Now, he understood the power of it, and why so many crews had perished in the waves where sirens resided. But, Odysseus was not the only Greek hero who was forced to face the sirens. Jason and the Argonauts passed through waters where the sirens lived on their way to retrieve the Golden Fleece as part of their quest. Much like Odysseus, Jason was a confident and wise leader. But Jason had even more confidence than Odysseus did, and part of that confidence rested in the power and talent of his crew the Argonauts. Orpheus, one of the crew members, was a man with superhuman musical abilities. His lyre playing was so beautiful that animals and even trees and rocks moved about him in dance. And Jason was confident that Orpheus could drown out the siren's music with his own. As they neared the fog encompassing the waters where the sirens resided, the crew was rigid and uncertain. Jason had full confidence in Orpheus, and Though the crew had been soothed by the heart-wrenchingly beautiful songs of Orpheus many times, they were unsure if the music could truly overpower the song of the sirens. But soon, they were sailing deeper into the fog. The curtain of fog washed over them, bringing with it a chill that surged through their bodies and prepared them for what was to come. 
Orpheus took a deep breath of the cool, brisk air, nourishing his body and soul before he began to play. The moment that music began to flow from his fingertips, Orpheus found himself smiling. The music was coming from him like it was an extension of himself. Every note, every chord was dripping from his fingertips and cascading into the sea below like it was made of silver and gold. It was a truly heavenly song, unlike anything he had ever played before. The crew members gazed at him in wonder as he played. They couldn't peel their eyes away from the way his fingertips danced with ease across the strings, plucking that melody into the air. They were transfixed, utterly enraptured by the soul-stirring music that was being played. They were so captivated, in fact, that they could not even hear the music that was rising up from the choppy waters around them. The sirens hovered along the rocky shores, singing their hauntingly beautiful song up to the sailors, and yet not a single sailor budged. They remained still staring at Orpheus, so wrapped up in his song that the sirens did not even exist to them. It wasn't long before the ship was out of the fog. Even after they escaped the fog, Orpheus continued to play as they sailed into the beautiful sunshine. And, though the siren songs carried on through the waters off the coast of Greece for decades, they were far from the only creature lurking beneath the waves of the Mediterranean Sea. On the shoreline, Queen Cassiopeia lived a lavish life with her daughter Andromeda. They lounged by the sparkling sea daily, wore the finest clothes in ancient Ethiopia, and dined on delicious food from the fresh farms around them. But there was a dark side to Queen Cassiopeia. She was a proud woman, a woman so infatuated with her own status and the perfection of her family that there was rarely a time when she wasn't talking about it. As her daughter Andromeda grew, she became an incredible beauty. People would stop in the streets simply to gawk at her. And, at times, they would gather around the royal estate, hoping to get just a glimpse of Andromeda as she lounged in her home or made her way through the many stunning corridors. Queen Cassiopeia was so proud of Andromeda's beauty that she began to speak a bit too highly of her. She boasted to everyone in the kingdom who would listen that Andromeda was more beautiful than the Nereids, the benevolent, compassionate, and stunning nymphs of the sea. The Nereids were highly offended when they heard of this. And when they told Poseidon, he knew something had to be done to punish Queen Cassiopeia for this indiscretion. On a dark, moonlit night, Andromeda 
went for a walk with her mother along the beach. Overhead, the full moon cast a silvery glow over everything, bathing the mother and daughter in such a gentle light that they could hardly think about anything other than what a marvelous night it was. But as they began to walk, the ocean beside them began to stir. The waters suddenly became choppy, and they seemed to grow darker and darker with every passing second. Andromeda stopped in her tracks and gazed out over the water, her eyes wavering with concern. The waves that were once lapping peacefully against the shore receded back into the ocean as if they were being peeled back by a powerful force. Shells and kelp and bits from long-forgotten shipwrecks were exposed on the ocean floor as the waves rolled back further and further towards the center of the sea. Andromeda and Queen Cassiopeia knew something strange was happening, but they couldn't put their fingers on what exactly it was. And then, As quickly as they had receded, the waves rushed towards the shoreline. Queen Cassiopeia grabbed her daughter by the hand and urged her to get further inland. But it was no use. The waves weren't just lapping the shoreline. They were heading straight at Andromeda. It was only once they got closer that the two women realized what they were looking at. It was Poseidon himself, mighty god of the sea, riding a foamy wave toward them. With no hesitation, Poseidon snapped at Cassiopeia, denouncing her for her vanity and hubris, and for needlessly insulting the Nereid. Queen Cassiopeia knew that Poseidon was not a forgiving god. She knew that her words that had greatly offended him would surely lead to her beloved daughter's demise. And indeed, that is how it seemed. To punish the queen for her arrogance, Poseidon flooded the entire coastal region of ancient Ethiopia and sent a terrifying sea monster, Cetus, to ravage the kingdom's inhabitants. In desperation, the king consulted the highest oracle of the land, who announced that no respite can be found until his daughter, Andromeda is offered in sacrifice to the monster, faithful to his foremost duty to save and protect his people. The king relented. Andromeda was thus left chained to a rock by the sea to await her death. Few knew what Cetus looked like, aside from the fact that it was a massive beast with large teeth that could swim quickly. Many believed Cetus to be indestructible, a creature that no one could strike down. So, as the beautiful Andromeda stood tied to a rock at the very edge of the sea, just above the waves, She believed her fate was sealed. Andromeda knew that soon Cetus would come for her. Just at the edge of the water, the mist 
was thick. Andromeda breathed in the salty, refreshing sea air, trying to calm herself in her situation. She took big, deep breaths to center herself. She tried to think of a way out of this, of a way to defeat the monster. She wondered if she could call upon the Nereids and apologize for her mother's transgression, or if she could somehow wiggle her way out of her binds. But, as the waves splashed against the rock, coating her in the froth of the ocean, it seemed less and less likely with every passing second, until, in the distance, Andromeda saw something rather peculiar. In the waves far towards the horizon, she could see bubbles rising. Surely, bubbles from Cetus. But just beyond that, there was something making its way through the sky. But upon closer inspection, it was not something. It was someone. Perseus, a famed Greek hero, was returning home from a mission he had been sent on to kill Medusa, beloved by the gods. He had been given several gifts to aid him on his quest, including a pair of winged sandals that had been given to him by the god Hermes. He flew towards Andromeda, and as he did, a puzzled expression washed over his face. He was confused at the sight of Andromeda tied to the rocks. And the moment he laid eyes on Andromeda, he was overcome with emotion. A warmth surged through his whole body. A warmth that made his heart skip a beat and his soul stir in a way that it never had before. Andromeda's beauty stunned him. But not just her beauty, the energy that was radiating from her. He had never seen a woman that had made him feel this way before. Just as this powerful feeling of love and admiration swept over him. He suddenly noticed Cetus underneath, who was flying through the water at lightning speed. Perseus had heard tales of Cetus, and he knew that no man had ever been a match for Cetus before. Determined to save the beautiful woman who he had fallen in love with at first sight, Perseus flew down to Andromeda. He promised her that he would save her, urging her to take deep breaths and remain calm. Andromeda continued to breathe deeply. She wanted to close her eyes, but the sight of Perseus flying through the sky toward her made her heart skip a beat. He was a handsome man, but more importantly, a gentle soul that knew no fear or trepidation. Perseus hovered before Andromeda, putting a protective arm out in front of her. Cetus grew closer and closer, and as he did, Andromeda tensed more and more. She wondered what plan Perseus had in mind. And then, Cetus leapt from the waves. Just as Cetus rose from the waves, Perseus lifted up the head of Medusa, 
the beast laid eyes on Medusa's head and instantly turned to stone. Ceta sank to the bottom of the ocean before Perseus and Andromeda, leaving them safe and relieved. Perseus embraced Andromeda and took her back to her parents' home, where they were happily wed. And, fortunately for the people of ancient Greece and Ethiopia, Cetus was no more. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. The myths of ancient Greece were born from their connection to the ocean and their connection to adventure. Surely they were lying in bed, dreaming of crossing the sea, just as you may be now. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pobs Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and tonight I will be your guide as we journey to ancient Greece to hear the most boring myth of all time. The kind of tale that will make you knock out faster than your grandpa after Thanksgiving dinner. The kind of story that will give you a first-class ticket straight to dreamland, with lots of dull, bland, insipid scenery along the way. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to relax and find comfort in the space that we're in, here and now. Because, well, you know, we're here, and it's now, so we might as well. Close your eyes, if they're not closed already. Honestly, they probably should be at this point, unless you sleep with your eyes open, which, well, we don't judge here. But maybe keep that little habit to yourself. With your eyes closed, turn your attention to your breathing. Notice how your body feels as you breathe in, then out. In, then out. Surely, you know how this goes by now. Now, turn your attention to the muscles in your arms, legs, torso, and head. Imagine you are a certain copywritten green character with giant muscles. You know the one that has some bulk to him. Some may say huge, perhaps a combination of the two. Ball your hands into fists and tense your arms as much as you can and hold for a few moments. As you untense your arms and hands, notice how much lighter and more relaxed your muscles feel. If your arms had eyes, they'd have cucumber slices over them and be lying in a lawn chair in the Caribbean right about now. Now, turn your attention your legs. Tense your legs as much as you possibly can, curling your toes and squeezing your knees together until you feel like a frog leaping off a lily pad on a serene, peaceful lake. 
that's right. We're not just going to talk about superheroes here. After all, we are into sleep and meditation as well. As you untense your legs, feel them sink deeper into the mattress beneath you. Now, turn your attention to your torso. Take a deep breath and squeeze your abs like there's a personal trainer standing over you. Feel that tension build and build until finally you release it, feeling a wave of relaxation wash over you. And finally, focus on your head. Are you carrying any tension from the day there? Squeeze your eyes, clench your teeth together, and draw your shoulders up toward your ears. Hold that tension until finally you release it, allowing your shoulders to drop and your eyes to relax. Now that we've taken the time to relax and find comfort in the space that we're in, here and now, let us begin our story. Picture it. You are in ancient Greece. Nearly everyone you see looks good enough to be a Greek god. Just don't tell that to Zeus or Aphrodite. We're trying to relax here, not be smoked or turned into a goose or whatever else those two enjoy doing in their spare time. The streets are busy with these beautiful people. Beautiful people telling stories. Beautiful people laughing beautiful people, visiting food stands, and walking away with food we can't even imagine eating today. It's a lively scene. You're in the city-state of Ephora, which some historians actually believe is just another name for Corinth. But hey, what do I know? It's all Greek to me. And here, all seems peaceful. The city is thriving. The people are happy and fed. There is no war. The only drama they ever seem to run into is when their gods float on down to cause a little ruckus here and there. It gets boring up at Olympus. I mean, can you blame them for getting a little rowdy? And, at the end of the day, for the most part, the people of Ephora don't mind. Dionysus does throw a mean party, after all. If you like wine and grapes, and old men that play horn instruments, that is. The king and founder of Ephora, Sisyphus, was the exact kind of leader this new city-state needed. He built roads, he opened up the city's ports, and encouraged commerce and trade with other places. He encouraged the people of his city to get out and explore, to learn navigation, and sail off into the sunset to see what the ocean and seas had beyond them. Pretty nice of him. Until you remember that back then, they thought there were giant sea monsters that would destroy any boat that came near them. But, regardless, Sisyphus 
seemed like a nice leader at first. From the outside, looking in, he was powerful. But with power comes a few character traits that are, shall we say, less than desirable. Sisyphus was an avaricious man. For the most part, he cared only about money and accruing more fame and power for himself. If Vegas had been around, this man would have wanted his name flashing over the strip in neon lights. But Vegas wasn't around, and candlelight doesn't quite look as flashy. So, he had to take a different route to show his power and strength. Sisyphus did something a tad bit unconventional. He killed guests and visitors that arrived at his palace from other cities. Imagine if you traveled to Britain and the queen popped out of Big Ben with an axe. That's the kind of power move that King Sisyphus decided to pull. And, for the most part, it worked. Oddly, people kept visiting from out of town. But it worked. Kingdoms all over saw the power of Sisyphus and feared the king who ruled with such an iron fist, the king who would kill anyone so much as stepped on his palace grounds. By modern standards, we may consider the man to be a bit unhinged, but this is ancient Greece we're talking about here. A little Sunday samba with a sword was as normal as grabbing brunch with friends. And so, for quite some time, Sisyphus lived a peaceful life. His subjects and visitors sure didn't. But he did. He had all the luxury that ancient Greece had to offer. He could lounge on fainting couches and be fed grapes as the sun made its lazy arc across the sky, casting warm rays on his bare skin. He could sip from cups of pure gold as he munched on dates and fine food that was brought to him from all over Greece by people who probably weren't alive anymore. He could sit out on his balcony, one of the many in his palace, and watch as the stars flickered to life against the inky black sky. There were always dozens of servants around him, bringing him whatever he wanted and needed. Cold drinks, sweet desserts, fresh rich dishes made by his own personal cook. Life as a king was the kind of life people dreamed of. But it came with a bit of a catch. Because, you see, killing guests that arrived at his castle in order to show his power Sisyphus was actually putting himself in danger because Sisyphus was violating Exania, the rule that demanded leaders show hospitality to guests traveling to their kingdom. This violation of the rule angered Zeus greatly, who slowly began to decide that he didn't quite like this king, this ruler. 
But Zeus, as I'm sure you're aware, wasn't quite the freshest rose in the garden. If you catch my drift, he tended to dabble where he shouldn't have. Spend some very, very quality time with people he shouldn't have and wasn't much of a rule follower himself. One day, Zeus took the form of an eagle and flew high above ancient Greece. The wind brushed over the great god's feathers as he dipped and dived through the clouds. He was majestic, beautiful even, soaring through the wonderland, seemingly without a care in the world. With such grace and comfort, in the moments where he was high above everything, sailing off to only Zeus knows where. Some people down below fantasized that Zeus was flying off to distant islands to lounge on beaches far, far away from his obligations. Others believed that he was drifting with the breeze, breathing in the sweet aroma of pine trees and the salty ocean air, and letting it take him wherever it wanted. But Zeus wasn't flying to distant beaches or enjoying the sights as the breeze took him wherever it wished. Zeus was on his way to do what Zeus did best, to kidnap a beautiful young woman, Aegina, the daughter of the river god Asopos, was the target of Zeus's affection that day. A stunning nymph with a gentle demeanor and Many people loved her. She fit Zeus's typical M.O. quite well. And so, on that fateful day, Zeus swept down through the clouds and took poor Aegina in his giant talons, whisking her off into the sky. He flew over Ephra, where Sisyphus was sitting out on his balcony, enjoying watching the world go by. When he spotted Zeus in his giant eagle form, flying over the city with a girl in his talons, hundreds of feet above the city, he sighed and probably thought to himself, something along the lines of another normal day in ancient Greece. Zeus landed on an island near Attica, which he cheerfully declared would be Aegina's new home, much to Aegina's disappointment. She had been having a wonderful day by the river, and now she had to be grateful that her kidnapper dropped her off on an island instead of the pits of Tartarus. But what Aegina didn't know is that she had a rescuer on the way. Her father, Asopus, had seen her get kidnapped by Zeus and chased after them. He followed the river using his power until he lost them somewhere near Ephira. Asopus was devastated. He loved his daughter dearly and wanted to rescue her from her unfortunate fate. When Asopus lost his daughter, he decided to take the next logical step. He went to Sisyphus 
hoping that the king might have seen something. When Sisyphus heard what Asopus was there for, he was kind enough not to murder the river god. He knew that Zeus would be furious with him if he told Asopus where his daughter was. Zeus could smite him, could turn him into a bug, could make him fall in love with a bull, or a tree, or his own reflection. And so, Sisyphus did the only logical thing. He told Asopus exactly where Zeus had taken his daughter. Because some people, like Sisyphus, just like to see a few dashes of drama in their day. Plus, Asopus did offer to make a spring flow on the Corinthian Acropolis for Sisyphus's help. And so, Asopus followed the directions Sisyphus had given him and pursued after his daughter, sailing across the sea to the island where his daughter was. But Zeus faced Asopus and gave him a challenge he couldn't quite overcome. He threw thunderbolts at Asopus, giant glowing beacons of pure energy, electricity, and power. Thunderbolts that illuminated the entire sky as they made their way down to the sea that Asopus was trying to cross. This forced Asopus to give up his pursuit and head back to his own waters. Agena remained on the island where she gave birth to Zeus's son, Aeacus, who would, one day, become king of the island. Clearly, her family was a big fan of names that started with A. Just because Zeus got his way did not mean that Zeus wasn't going to punish Sisyphus for his betrayal. He had nearly made Zeus lose his hundredth, maybe thousandth lover. Something incredibly valuable to poor lonely old Zeus. Zeus wouldn't stand for that kind of behavior from someone under his rule. He decided that Sisyphus's days were over and ordered Thanatos to chain Sisyphus up in Tartarus. Tartarus, a place worse than the DMV worse than getting her tooth extracted, worse than death itself. Rather than be concerned about his eternal damnation to Tartarus, Sisyphus had questions. He had not been greeted by Charon, whose job was to guide souls into the underworld. He found this incredibly odd and it gave him the overwhelming feeling that he had somehow gotten the upper hand. Thanatos led Sisyphus down into the underworld of Tartarus. Bright red and orange flames licked against the cavern walls that lined the walkway to the cavern where Sisyphus would be imprisoned. In the distance, Sisyphus could hear the sounds of other beings who had betrayed Zeus calling out for help. But this didn't scare Sisyphus because, remember, Sisyphus was a confident ruler, a man sure in his ability, a man full of knowledge and wit and, well, himself, very, very full of himself. 
when it came time for Thanatos to chain up Sisyphus. Sisyphus canted his head to the side and made questionable, curious little hums underneath his breath. He asked Thanatos how the chains worked. They appeared to be so powerful, so unbreakable. But how was that possible? Could you show me? He asked, trying to hide the grin that desperately wanted to cross his lips. Tired and overworked, Thanatos snapped the chains on himself to demonstrate how they worked. See? They are unbreakable. There's no way to escape them, he explained, shaking and hitting the binds to show how truly unbreakable they were. Sisyphus grinned. How intriguing. He reclined on a nearby rock and stretched with an air of complete and total relaxation. So, you couldn't escape those binds, even if you wanted to right now. You don't have a key of any kind on you. Thanatos shrugged and happily chimed, nope, these can't come off. And so, they won't, Sisyphus replied, giving Thanatos a wave as he began to walk back out of the cavern. Realizing what had been done, Thanatos called out to the king, desperate to be rescued. But Sisyphus just smiled to himself and continued on. Surely this wouldn't come back to bite him someday. With Thanatos, the god of death, chained in Tartarus, Sisyphus meandered back up to his kingdom and took his spot back on the throne. His wife, Merope, was thrilled to have her husband back in her arms, even if he did murder people who came to their palace. The two lived in peace for quite some time, indulging in all the luxuries that they had. They ate grapes as they reclined on fainting couches. They curled up in each other's arms and watched the stars go by every night, painting the sky with a sparkling display of black, blue, and gold. They dined on the finest foods and drank the finest wines. And meanwhile, the world kept on turning, seemingly forgetting all about the fact that Sisyphus had been sentenced to death. But something odd began to happen around the world. People weren't dying. While the average person was relieved by this, and many considered it to be a gift from the gods, some others were rather upset by this suddenly happening, namely the gods themselves. Ares, the god of war, could not understand why his opponents weren't dying in battle. After all, that was kind of his whole deal. Furious and understanding that something was clearly wrong here, Ares stormed up to Olympus to confront Zeus about this sudden change. And for a moment, Zeus was stumped. Furious, he called upon Thanatos angry with him for not doing his job. 
What was everyone else doing while Zeus was throwing thunderbolts and kidnapping people? Just lazing around, doing zilch? But when Thanatos didn't come after being summoned, Zeus suspected that something was deeply, truly wrong here. He sent Ares down to Tartarus, and when he arrived, he was shocked to find Thanatos chained, looking exhausted and relieved to have a rescuer finally come for him. If you thought Zeus was upset before, this was a whole different level. Ares told Zeus what happened. In a rage, Zeus decided to put an end to Sisyphus once and for all. He killed the king, sending him to the underworld. But Sisyphus was not an unintelligent man. After all, he had already outsmarted death once, and after truly being killed, he was about to outsmart death again. Sisyphus told his wife that in the event of his death, she was not to give him a proper burial, as was customary and incredibly important in ancient Greece. He ordered her to throw his lifeless body into a town square, telling her that this was an ultimate test of her love, that he would be able to see in death. Merope did as she was told. Through her tears, she dramatically tossed her husband's body onto the streets of the city he had once ruled. She expected an uproar for townspeople to be in tears, but for the most part, people meandered on without giving the body so much as a second glance. Their thought on seeing it was almost definitely, oh, another day in ancient Greece. At least he didn't get turned into a swan. As a result of not being given a proper burial, Sisyphus awakened on the edge of the river Styx. And that, my friends, is where he had to put on his acting shoes once more. He traveled through the underworld until he found Persephone, queen of the underworld. She greeted him with a warm smile, since he was pretending to be in immense pain and harboring immense anger. He told Persephone what had happened to his body that he was tossed into the streets he had once ruled, with no words said, no rights given, nothing. He hadn't been properly cared for by his wife. The person that he thought loved him more than anyone else on earth. A sucker for love, Persephone was touched and wounded deeply by the story that poor Sisyphus told her. She took his hands gently in hers and promised him that she would give him a chance to confront his wife and punish her for her inappropriate behavior. She released Sisyphus from the underworld so he could go to the surface and find his wife. Sisyphus thanked Persephone, appreciating her for the goddess that she was. But 
as soon as he left the underworld, his tears dried up. He journeyed back to the surface over familiar roads, crossing familiar bridges, and making his way down dirt streets that he had created as the city's ruler. When he found his wife, he greeted her with a sour look. He told her to follow him out onto the city streets where his body had been tossed in front of everyone in the town square. Sisyphus reprimanded his wife, calling her behavior an ultimate betrayal. Catching on to his motive, Merope knelt before her husband and apologized to him, begging for forgiveness. Everyone in the city saw Sisyphus had risen from the dead. Everyone saw the way he had admonished his wife for her behavior. And they all believed he was even more powerful than they had previously thought. After all, he had returned from death not just once, but twice. After punishing his wife, Sisyphus was expected to return to the underworld. After all, that was the deal that he had made with Persephone. A deal that she offered from the kindness of her heart. But Sisyphus wasn't one for kindness in any form. So he decided he was going to stay on as king with his wife by his side. And Persephone was a rather busy woman in the underworld, so she didn't check to see if Sisyphus had returned to the underworld as he promised. For quite some time, Sisyphus lived a peaceful life with his wife and kids. But a man of his hubris cannot live peacefully for his whole life. Sisyphus eventually grew a bit bored of his ordinary life. He bragged to anyone and everyone who would listen about how he had escaped death, about how he was the most cunning, wise, and tricky man in all the world about how he was even wiser than Zeus himself. Zeus wasn't a huge fan of people saying they were better than him in any way, shape, or form. This news traveled back to Zeus rather quickly, and frankly, he was rather sick of hearing the name Sisyphus tossed around. Frustrated and furious with Sisyphus for outsmarting death once more, Zeus sent Hermes to find Sisyphus and drag him to the underworld. Sisyphus knew that Hermes was in pursuit of him. He knew it would be best to hide his identity to retreat somewhere where he couldn't be found, to take on a disguise. Unfortunately, they didn't have stick-on moustaches in ancient Greece, so Sisyphus was forced to hide by other means. He spent much of his time out of his kingdom in the woods, but Traveling through the woods isn't exactly discreet. When you're bringing a caravan, multiple servants, a personal foot misuse, and a sandal shiner with you. As a result, Sisyphus was found rather quickly. When Hermes came and grabbed him by the ear, 
Sisyphus tried to talk Hermes out of it. He tried to use his wit to stay as ruler, to stay in the world of the living. But in the end, it was no use. While his wife was in the middle of getting a massage from their five-star foot misuse, Sisyphus was dragged by Hermes and his winged sandals to the underworld, where a punishment worse than death awaited him. Zeus instructed Sisyphus to roll a boulder up a large mountain. If he was so clever, surely he should be able to do it. At first, Sisyphus wasn't too concerned with the task. He rolled the boulder up the hill, pulling a hamstring on the way. He had never been much for leg exercise, after all. Eating grapes on a fainting couch is much more of a triceps workout. As Sisyphus rolled the boulder up the mountain, his mind was reeling with possibilities, with tricks he could use to get out of this. Could he trick Zeus again? Once he got the boulder up to the top, could he somehow talk to Persephone and get himself out of Tartarus altogether? When Sisyphus reached the top of the mountain, he felt a moment of confidence. But the confidence was squashed as he watched the boulder magically roll back down to the bottom of the mountain. That's when Zeus and Hermes told him about the reality of his task. He was to spend eternity rolling the boulder up the hill, only for it to roll back down again. Sisyphus had no choice. He continued to roll the boulder up the mountain, cursing Zeus under his breath as he did so. For quite some time, he was viewed as the cleverest, deceitful king of all. But now, Sisyphus had been bested. Some say Sisyphus is still rolling the boulder up the hill to this very day. Some say he is still plotting against Zeus, trying to come up with a plan to get out of his eternal, fruitless task. Knowing Sisyphus, surely he will someday get the upper hand on Zeus. But... Till then, he will continue to roll the boulder up. Watch it roll down. Up. Then down. Up. Then down. I hope you have enjoyed this story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. Hopefully, it was boring enough to get you that one-way ticket to dreamland. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams.